Ready to go live? Okay, we're live. Imagine a place where everyone is oh happy. Oh my god. And they live like a fan. Strange suicide of the third. It's very strange. Four bodies. Six bodies. Ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, nine, nineteen. Grand total to thirty-nine. Thirty-nine people. Federal agents first confronted a heavily armed religious cult near Waco. 911, what's your emergency? Uh, there are 75 men around our building and they're shooting at us in Mount Carmel. Tell them there are children and women in here to call it off. I hear a gun. Who are these people? It was such a love affair, it was such enthusiasm, such joy, and we worked such long days, but you just had the energy to do it. A number of people simply followed fairly blindly the directions of their leadership, even though they were intelligent and well-educated enough to have gone their own way. They didn't, because they surrendered themselves to this... Uh, This is where we expose the cults and the sinners who lead them. Make sure you subscribe to the channel right here. Cult Rehab every week on The Drip, live stream on YouTube. Join into the comment section. Join the congregation. Listen to real brainwashing stories, sex scandals, cult rituals, unholy practices, all performed by these sinners heading up the cult. Listen to cult survivors getting interviewed and cult leaders getting roasted. Is someone trying to recruit you? Well, screw them and their cult. Join the anti-cult cult right here on Cult Rehab. Too many cults? Maybe I said cult too many times. I don't know. Sign it up. Come on in. We'll talk about it. We'll talk about it for the community, for the culture. Figure out what's going on. Do the forgiveness. God is great. So make sure you watch Cult Rehab. It's not a cult. It's an anti-cult cult. All right. All right. <laughs> Welcome to the service, everybody. Welcome to the service. Uh, cult Rehab. Um, episode like eight or something? But uh, yeah, no, uh, look at these puppies and, and, and fill your heart with loving kindness because we're all here. This is a service where we all get together and uh, we want to have a high vibration. We need to raise the vibration. That's the that's the whole point of this digital ashram. What an inspirational song, too. Dun, dun, dun. Hold on, let me. Come on in, come on in. I'm here at the Eshram. Uh, Al Shami's already here saying, I'm here to do my karmas. Thanks, thanks. You were all here to do our karmas. And what joyful karmas we have today. We're going to talk to a, another cult survivor. She was born into a uh, life spring. Big, big banger of a cult. Hold up, let me, let me remove that. Let me play our standard 75th and lower. Yeah, that's it. Get funky with that music, people. We're we gotta we wanna raise the vibration here on the drip, cult rehab, live Sundays. Um, we've done so many. They're all so interesting. They're fascinating conversations. So much better than comics complaining about like how they need more stage time or whatever. It's like, come on. This is this is important. These are powerful karmas. So thanks for coming in. Oh, David Barron, yeah, I got your book. <laughs> Building your cult. You psycho. You sent me this book. You wrote this book. Dentalian Jones, David Barron, Dentalian Jones also says doing my covers, but sent me a book called Building Your Cult. Let me tell you guys something. You know, I joke here. I joke here about starting a cult. What's starting a cult here on YouTube? But oh my God, I saw some like large group awareness training videos today. I can't, you know, I'm like, I can't, I'm such a great guy. I would never do it. Such a bunch of psychos. Um, but I've been saying on the show for months, actually, that there is like an underlying program to all these cults. And, uh, you know, David, I'm sure your book covers some of it, Building Your Cult. I'm sure. You, and, and you do mean like more of like in a business or personal brand cult following kind of a way. But, um, yeah, no, I was uh, I've been saying for a while on the show that like basically you got like cults and then you got con artists like scams, like get rich quick schemes. And then you have like sales, like corporate sales. And if you look underneath, it's all almost like a very similar uh, curriculum that is underlying all of them. And uh, I feel like large group awareness training is that curriculum. Large group awareness training might be the name of it. it, it like, apparently it came from this SD training. Um, 
But then I think large group awareness training is like an umbrella term for cult brainwashing classes. And uh, our guest today was is, is the daughter of someone who made one of those uh, programs called LifeSpring. But from what I've heard, like the LifeSpring programming is basically large group awareness training. And uh, I, guess I, I just saw some incredible documentaries today, actually, um, about it. So wild. Look at this. I'm going to show this to you. Hold on. Uh... <laughs> I'm going to, actually, let's let's bring on our guest and then we're going to look at this clip together because it's a great clip of some large group awareness training and just the kind of thing that y'all can watch out for because I know the people here, listen, we all got to be careful. You know, it's hard times coming. Roe v. Wade overturned. The economy's in shit. Everything's on. It's 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 a wild world we're going into. So you got to be careful right now. You got to make sure you're up aware on your cult the psychology, the brainwash tactics. No, that's why that's why we're here. That's why we got to talk to these people. And honestly, the cult rehab guests have been very like wise because it's like they come out of one brainwash, then they see brainwash in just the general society. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I'm gonna bring on our guest today. She's a she. Actually, we had a, a very friendly chat right before, but we've been texting about this stuff, and I think we're gonna have an incredible conversation with her. Y'all are gonna love her. Give it up for the hilarious, not the hilarious, sorry, hilarious too. But I, I'm so used to doing stand up. I'm sorry. Uh, give it up for the uh, the survive cult survive. I don't know. give it up for the very joyful and very loving and uh, doing incredible karmas on this earth. Alicia Archer, everybody. Alicia, thanks for coming on. Hi, hello, friend. Uh, hello, hello, hello. Um, wow, born into life spring, eh? I was, yeah. It was a trip. I would not recommend it. Yeah, yeah. And then, and then you're you're. We were just talking before the show about how like. Because you're born in to the you're born in to the guy's thing. So it's like later in your life, like other people had to tell you, like, oh, you're in a cult. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I thought that I was a civilian cult enthusiast. Yeah. That spent my free time learning about my favorite cults and like nerding out on, you know, we all kind of enjoy the extremes of human psychology to some right. degree. And then I was well into my 20s when one of my many brothers um, sent me a link to the Wikipedia page for LifeSpring. And I saw the word cult in it and immediately everything clicked into place. Wow. And so it's perfectly valid if someone was involved with LifeSpring, their experience of it was not a cult experience. Right. Um, I would argue that their experience was exploitative that they were under a uh, coercion um and control but cult or not it was a like really 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 demanding world bending experience wow. that a lot of work eh? escaped it and so for me that's all it takes if you feel like you had to escape it it was coercive control to some degree and it's not okay. So that's where I've landed after all this time. But it's still weird to me that the strange circumstances that I grew up in turned out to be a cult. Yeah, yeah. It is wild that your brother has to text you like, hey, mm -hmm. I think we're in a cult. I think I think we were born in a cult. And you're like, damn. Yeah. And you read up on it. So until then, you just thought you're doing your own Hinduism. You thought like, look, there's the Hindus, there's the Jews, and then we got life spring. Well, so I had been I had been kicked out. Oh, they kicked you out? They kicked me out. I know. Why wouldn't you want me uh, to be in your cult? You, uh, <laughs> were you tr your troublemaker? Were you a troublemaker? Yeah. You, you are like point. you are like a conservative nightmare, aren't you? You're like you're yeah. you're like someone that just naturally just pisses off like hard like someone's too conservative like that, you know? Yes. And there wow. are it's not an explicitly right wing group, but I would argue that it's an explicitly right wing kind of authoritarian reactionary set of beliefs and it's patriarchal, so, I guess. It, oh it, yeah. It's always like that, right? Like you're, you're being told, even like last week we had Natasha on from, uh, she was a Jehovah's witness and, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, sorry, not Natasha, Jennifer, but Jennifer was saying that like, yeah, growing up, it was like, you're supposed to be like a virgin and you're supposed to, to be like, like there's just sexist views constantly coming in. Um, and then if you're the kind of person who's like, well, I don't agree with that or I'm not going to do it, then they right. just. So is that what it took? Like, how 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 hard did you have to go to get kicked out? That's pretty rock and roll that you got kicked out, actually. Thanks. 
uh, it felt pretty rock and roll. It was pretty dramatic. So the um, if you were to go into the training and ask if this was a patriarchal system or if women were seen as lesser, they would say absolutely not. Everyone has equal potential. Everyone can, you know, realize their full potential. They called it the human potential movement. And yeah. your your quality as a person or your value as a person was more or less determined by how good you are at public speaking and how well you per perform capitalism. And wow. if you can do both of those things, if you can be making money and you can be kind of living a narcissistic dream where everybody is clapping for you and convinced by you and inspired by the very shiny version of your life that you tell <laughs> that, sorry, my dog is so angry. Okay. <laughs> what, your dog's angry? How come? What happened to the dog? So pedestrians keep walking in front of my house. Right. And that's so fully unacceptable to her. Um, right, right. <laughs> protective. Oh, yeah. She's protective. He's, I he's get protective. it, man. Life is tough. It's tough. Um, so if you had gone to a life spring training, there wouldn't be up front an idea that women needed to be subservient or that women were destined to be small or to serve men. But organizations with similar belief systems to LifeSpring. So you have Landmark Forum um, or EST, the Air Heart Seminars Training. They all came from the same place. I'm happy yeah. to talk about the structure. It's very corporate. Um, wow. And uh, like being but a Patel. Them. what's yeah. that? It's like being a Patel. It's so Patel. I think there's some Hindu mm -hmm. cults that do this, but they get away with it because it's like it's brown. So nobody's going to question them, you know, like. It's like Om Shinrikyo in Japan. Nobody wanted to touch it because it was a religion. And then yeah. you get sarin gas. And <sighs> yeah. I mean, That's what tough, a bad right? day. When you, yeah. <laughs> but um, once you really get into the meat of life spring, you would encounter what I did growing up, which is that this there's this belief that women are inherently manipulative. Women are inherently liars that wow. we put this mantle of victimhood on ourselves. And the, the group will say that men do it too, but the belief of the person leading the group, and ultimately that comes down to my dad, is one where women are superficial creatures who want to extract money and attention from men and will do anything and have no ethics. Yeah, around. yeah. And so, it's crazy how there's a percentage of that that's just in general in the society. Like I, oh, yeah. I just got yelled at by a friend who's very he's like more he's like a patriarchal maybe more and and I, and I was telling him that like I don't think girls care about money when you're dating and he's like you're you're crazy you're living in a fantasy world what are you stupid you got to look at the facts man and there's just no way to prove it like all the facts are really just very opinions that people have and uh, I think it's like a sign of brainwash actually. Is just taught from such a young age. It's it's true. I've certainly heard that my entire life, but I've never had a girlfriend say to me that they cared whether somebody was wealthy or not. I've never gotten that from the source of a dating person that they cared. I find women are romantics. I've very yeah. often looked at girls and said, you need to date a guy who makes more money. You're like, what are you doing? Like I, friends yeah. of mine where I'm like, I'm like, this is unstable. You dating these guys like, like, like there's, I know so many cool girls that like, it's almost like a good job. It's, it's like a red flag to them. They want, I mean, they want a red flag or else they can't get excited. They want a guy like a little wild and like, it, it just seems like more rom romantic than to me. That's, that's what I've always found. Um, in Hinduism though, we had these whole parables that teach that like women are shifty maybe. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yes. You, do, do, that you were have, devious. Devious. Yeah. You had yeah. You like parables, you had stories. No, it was personal examples of life right. experiences, right? But the the truth that could be found in that was probably really, really tiny. And then there's almost like this mucus that this gunky, gross stuff that surrounds that kernel of truth um, in everything that my father would talk about, where somehow every story turned into 
he was the hero. Yeah. He was the most important person. And everyone else was at once sophisticated enough to be devious or to cheat him or to wrong him, but also less intelligent than him, less worthy than him because they didn't get it. And he did. And wow. if you try to articulate what it is, what it was that he got that other people didn't get. I think what he didn't know he was doing was describing his own absence of empathy. So where other people would have something he considered a stumbling block to success, mm -hmm. that would be him seeing their empathy as a weakness. It's like projection. It. Yeah. Like he's just not getting it. They're not, I, I feel like people do project their issues onto that, onto the opposite sex a lot of times, or like just men yeah. will project their issues onto women like that, where it's like, maybe so much there's so much vulnerability in desiring someone and wanting them to like you. Right. And I think that we all have this impulse somewhere where you, you want that person to like you. You want them to also have a crush on you or you, yeah. you want them to feel a certain way. And that puts you in a position where they have power over you. And so it's a really easy knee jerk reaction to suddenly be critical of them or controlling of them yeah yeah it's very incel and if you look at all the incel speakers it is like a bunch of guys who didn't get laid and then they're pissed off and then they're like you guys are letting the women be whores and they're running around like they're it yeah. is like a lot of them teaching younger guys but you can see their bitterness like they're pissed yeah. that maybe they didn't get laid or you know it's like it's like i don't want to i don't want to like you know he just passed away but there's a guy kevin samuels that did a lot of talk on this and he was like berating women for like leaving their husbands, you know, like that kind of patriarchal like dad talk. Yeah. And uh, and he was twice divorced himself. And it's like as yeah. a loving kindness coach, that's a lot of suffering. You can't mm -hmm. judge someone without judging yourself. Like you can clearly see this projection. But he was bitter. He was like so mean to these girls that called him. I could say the same thing um, about Robert White, my dad. Um, for some reason in the family, I've like called him by his first and last name for so many years. I don't even know where it started. Right. Some of my siblings do the same thing. But he spent more than a decade uh, stalking, harassing, and abusing my mom because she left him. And how oh dare she? God. It's like, it's very, it's, it's incel shit. It's just incel shit. And for someone who has uh, so many practice speeches against being the victim and seeing yourself as the victim, he sure has been victimized yeah. unfairly by every woman he's ever desired. And um, so when, to answer your question from way back, when I was, coming into my early teen years, my mom sent me to live with my dad because she was like, I can't, I can't handle you. I don't want you. They had already given up my three siblings in different contexts. Yeah. Oh like my in, God. In the, the line, you got the boot. No, so, this is eight, 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 10 years old. The mom's like, listen, if you don't. My little sister was seven when seven. she got put into foster care. <sighs> yeah. I was in the fourth grade. My brother was put into foster care, I think the first time at four years old. And, and then- this, this dad, this like yeah. patriarchal dad, man, like this man's man dad, he didn't he didn't want to take care of you. Like he didn't want to say like, send him to me or that wasn't an option. He had four sons before that right. in two previous relationships, all of whom he abused and abandoned. And none of them were as, none of them were useful to him. So they, they simply did not matter. And so when he, but I think there was a thing with my mom where she was kind of going to be the chosen one. Like she was like, that's where the really special kids were going to come out of that relationship. Somebody who might carry on his legacy. Yeah. And so we were held to that standard. We were held fully to the adult life spring standard from the beginning. And my brother, nobody can live up to that. No. Wow. One. So yeah, because the, the life spring is a whole like life improvement class yep. and a life efficiency class. It is yep. very numbers and like corporate almost, but they're taking your emotional life and putting it in this corporate thing. So even yeah. as a seven year old, they're like, well, you didn't do the garbage. You didn't do this. You're a pain in the ass. I think mm -hmm. you're leaving. And then they just at, at that age will just yeah. put you through that kind of 
grading system and then you don't get love anymore. And it wasn't even like you didn't take out the trash or you got in trouble at school. It was you were angry earlier today and that is a lower form of communication that you're choosing because you want to manipulate me. You're a liar. You're a manipulator. You're a bad kid. Wow. You're not going to do well. Right. So it was micromanaging, not just your actions, but your emotional response to everything that you experience. Like we had a chart on the wall and there were the bad words on the bottom and the good words on the top. And the bad words were things like, and this is for little kids, being yep. needy, crying, sadness, uh, hopelessness, pain, yeah. Hungry, suffering, right? All of the it. inevitabilities of being a human being, the things that yeah. make the human experience rich but are challenging, were all on that list. Plus things that kids just can't help, like being needy or being whiny. Right. Um, and then on the top of the list are things like successful, energetic, dynamic, um, magnetic personality, happy. <laughs> joy, freedom, success, and money. And so it was very much like this, the way that I grew up was that the fundamental truths of the universe were like the, the life that you see on a celebrity's Instagram. That's what's important. Imagine you telling else, a five-year-old, like walking around, like I have a magnetic personality. My dude, can I just tell you, I had a full breakdown as a kid because I'm the same age as Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen, I think, give or take. Wow. And when I was in the third or fourth grade, I was tortured that they had achieved an appropriate level of success and that I had not. Oh like my, my heart ached every time I saw commercials for like the their VHS tapes because yeah. that was it wasn't that they were out there doing something yeah. neat. It's they were the ones doing what I thought was the minimum. It's like, like when someone compares me to Russell Peters and I'm like, it's like it's like weird. It's like I don't need to compare myself to some other, but you're doing this in grade four. Like you're in grade four. And so could you watch Full House or were you like, let's turn it off. I don't want to watch it. We didn't we didn't watch too much TV because the the that chart with the good and bad words was posted next to the TV and anything that didn't align with it well enough wasn't allowed to be on the TV and the kids on full house were allowed to complain, get in fights with each other, have something no happen at school that upsets you. And then you cry and your dad comforts you. That kind of thing was not happening at our house. Oh, come on. You can't get that. Bob Saget, end of the episode comforting. Honey. No, I they were too easy on their kids. Are. Too easy on the kids. Just like all the other kids' families. So I knew <sighs> that my classmates didn't have the same home environment. But I thought that's just because they were of weaker stuff. Soft. They didn't get it. They were soft. Their parents were soft. Wow. Watching Full House. I, yeah, 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 that is so, that's wild. But I would see Mary-Kate and Ashley Olsen with their careers at a young age, which they themselves have said they wouldn't wish on anyone. And I was like, I am so ashamed. I shouldn't even go to school tomorrow because I am so ashamed of myself for not having a multi-million dollar business. I don't have a producer credit on anything. Wow. Yeah. That's wild that these parents, they're, they're teaching this class. You couldn't even teach your kid. Like they couldn't even get the kids to do it. So what are they doing? Like... They're applying this corporate training to their own children. It's too abusive. And so, like, how does your dad stay with this? Like, doesn't at some point did you say, okay, I guess the cult thing's not working? Or does he just make bank? Like, he just makes a ton of money on it? Yes. He's been very clear that this was about money for him. I know that he enjoys power and control and that those are goals in his life. And he wants to control people. And he specifically wants to have power over young women. But when it really, really comes down to it, he wants money. He wants as much money as he can extract from people. And I've never, ever seen him have a moment of pause over ethics or if what he was doing was harmful to people. Um, sometimes I'm sure he thinks he is helping, but I think most of the time he thinks that he is fleecing people who 
are either smart enough to get with his program or they're not smart enough. And if they aren't, then they don't deserve their money anyway, because he's a better person than they are. And he deserves more money because he's superior to them. Cold blooded. Yeah. And also there's this belief in life spring and I think in a lot of other places in the culture and certainly in cults um, like Nexium or Est where there's this idea that there's no such thing as having a legitimate problem that anytime a person says, I'm sharing my story, I was victimized and this was not okay. Right. Or I'm sharing my story, I'm really struggling with something and I need help with it or the circumstances that I'm working under are unfair and I can't get ahead because yeah. of this justice. When I hear that kind of thing, I'm like, thank you so much for sharing. How can I be a resource to you? Right. Like, how can right. we help liberate each other? And lift a each loving other? attitude. You know, you have love in your heart. So that's our true nature. Yeah. We're supposed to be naturally helping each other if they have an issue. But this is brainwashing you to be like, well, it's like when you're kids, you're like, ah, this hurts. Ah, ah hurts is on the bottom list it's like nothing no. No, don't tell don't say hurts you right. you 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 hit your hurt yourself or like whatever but it's on the list and like they just apply that to the adults too then exactly and so say i went out and i, I broke my leg in the backyard and i came in crying it I would know. be the crying would be the problem because i'm putting myself in a victim role trying to get attention throwing myself a pity party, trying to manipulate the adults around me into feeling bad for me so I can have less responsibility. I don't want to be accountable for why my leg was broken. Maybe I was on the swing the wrong way. And this is actually my fault. And me crying is just this elaborate cover up to hide my sin of doing something wrong. So wow. it really turns all of your human reactions into something that you question and then squish down. So the way to respond to it like a dynamic and successful person is to like shut your mouth, wipe your tears off your face and fix your problem by yourself. If you need to crawl your, you're at like drag yourself to the ER, then you do that. Wow. But, but don't involve somebody else in your manufactured crisis because you want attention that's wild i went to like day one of the landmark forum someone talked me into going like six no months way. on zoom it was on zoom and it was like this other actor and she she talked me into it and she's tough and on the phone i was like this is i was like inspired just chatting with her but she talked me to going to the first one and they were so soft and i just realized though that they don't start the tough language until second episode on, or second class on i guess or like until you're in the family so they open it up with like sweet and they welcome you in and then and then it gets yeah. mean after a while. They'll bring in a little bit of like spiciness on day one so that it seems important and maybe even a little bit dangerous. Wow. So here's an example. In the original version of Life Spring, and it's just corporate names changing and leadership structures changing. None of it's interesting about the different versions of it. Um, but leadership dynamics was the very beginning of it. It was connected to a pyramid scheme that was taken down by the FTC. It's this whole thing. Wow. That's where my dad got his start. But when you would walk into, I think this is leadership dynamics, but it might have been early life spring as well. You walk into the room. They had a full-size cross per the crucifixion. Okay. A coffin, a human-sized dog cage. Like my big Doberman has a cage that I can fit in. So like that kind of dog Cage. A human, human-sized cage. Okay. A cage that you crawl into. Like Say no dog. more. <laughs> and a noose. Oh my god. And they use those props on people. Right. And so when they, when you come into the experience, it's very exciting and risky. And they're saying like, some of you are already dead inside, so we're gonna put you in the coffin, and you're gonna figure out if you really want to live. It's like there's, and they would the leadership dynamics people would say like oh the emergency rooms around up here they know us because we send people with broken bones to them and we had somebody die and then yeah. you're like gosh this is not just a corporate seminar i'm involved in something thrilling but none of it but there's no negativity and there's yeah. no attack until later because first it's excitement it's being part of something that's inspiring they right want right 
to kind of get high on the group experience, feel really happy and energetic. And then raise the stakes, you know, raise the stakes. Mm -hmm. Think about your death. One day and you will die through this like abusive break you down, build you up thing. And then while they're building you up, but none of the building you up is real. It's mm -hmm. all a, it's all an illusion. Then they get into recruiting you for the next more expensive version of the seminar. Yeah. And how many people are you going to sign up behind you uh, or else or else you don't want imp to improve your life? So if you don't bring in 10 more people and if you don't spend $10,000 on the next course or whatever it was at the time, then I think for the first course, let's see, I wrote this, is the one note I made. So in 1973, the first level, the cheapest level was a thousand dollars. Yeah. That's $6,600 today. Yeah. 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 So that like with inflation. It's money. That's big and the money. Next the next level is going to be even more. So if you don't want to, you know, get a second mortgage on your house to pay for that or go without something your child needs. And if you don't want to recruit 10 people behind you, you must not be committed. Yeah. And if you're not committed, you lose every bit of progress that you think you've made. And so suddenly they're threatening you with going back to where you were two days ago, where you were destroyed. Jeez. And Do they lock people in the cage? Anyone get in the cage and they go, you're locked in. Yeah. Oh yeah. People, of course. people got in the coffin. I remember growing up hearing about one of the trainers, somebody in who was coffin. around when I was a kid who had been put in the coffin for, it was like 10, 15 hours. Oh. And oh. instead of having a panic attack, he fell asleep. And that <laughs> like, if that doesn't sum up my childhood, that's, like nothing will. That's that, great that he fell asleep or that would have been a terrifying 15 hours. Because, because a weak person who needs to live in that hysteria would have a panic attack, right? Yeah. It's not just like something that happens organically in your body for yourself. That is totally natural. Like getting shut in a coffin, you know, it's terrifying. It's but scary to be buried. It's like buried alive fear. It's like it's it's like one of those. It could be like heights where or like a snake. Where you're born you know, with like, it, or yeah, you're born with it. It's like in your DNA. Like like the face of a snake will just make you freak out. Like you'll have dreams about mm -hmm. it, even if you've never seen a snake, because it's in the bones. You know that. But coffin, so like, it's oh, it's terrifying. I don't like it. But imagine like as a kid, if I had broken my leg in the backyard. If I had come in and said, I've broken my leg, laid down on the floor and fallen asleep, I would have been showing that I was bigger than that and that I wasn't trying wow. to create hysteria, you know, in the room. But if I came in crying and screaming with a broken leg, that appropriate physical and emotional response would be called inappropriate and actually malicious and mendacious. And Crazy how we know like we know today that that's just inappropriate way of raising right. children. Like these guys think they have an advanced psychology. It's so, it's so backward. Um, my, my, so we had the first guy that we had on the show on cult rehab. He was in uh, LG LGAT. He was paying, we didn't even know he came on the show. He was paying $2,500 a month us for, uh, for the large group awareness training. So they had a classic, they had like a classic first day move where they go, where they give you the agenda in the morning and the agenda is like, we're going to do this exercise, this exercise, whatever prop he had similar kind of props and then they were like at one o'clock uh we're gonna have a washing break and then whatever 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 but then every day and like, this is part of their script when one o'clock comes around they go hey everyone um it's one o'clock time for the bathroom break but everyone's such a loser here that we're not going to do the bathroom break so just hold it and they would go like marathons with like no no peeing no no bathroom breaks just to like kind of shame you i guess yeah it's it's really about making you feel so disempowered and so small that you think to yourself, I've always been this pathetic creature. And what a relief. Someone is finally being honest with me and treating me the way I deserve to be treated. Oh, that's so sad. You see what I mean? Like that. Yeah. So that's the context. And they can, I don't, I've never, I've never led a training. Um, I was, kicked out at 14 years old. Okay. I've been to trainings, but I've never, you know, I, I didn't have the money to give them. So I was not, you know, right. I wasn't in the room 
Well, Except Al in the background making Alicia, money. you missed out. You missed out on some incredible sales training because uh, Natalie Grand, uh, I put her comment up right there, but Natalie Grand and uh, I think mm -hmm. Jennifer too, were both in sales and the, the skills are transferring over. Like they say, they like, it's such intense sales techniques, but they were in Jehovah's Witnesses. Same thing though. They're, they're really good at sales. Yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. Natalie Grand's, uh, by the way, author of Cult Girls, um, great a great uh, book that you can get on Amazon uh, that Natalie Grand wrote about leaving uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses. But uh, Natalie Grand's asking about, I think this is a good time to, to do this one. Um, she says, so she's doing a little research on LifeSpring. Sounds like they make you do a lot of recruiting too. Yeah, like what's the recruiting sales process like? Because that's that's almost like the bread and butter of the call. Is like, you got to yeah. get the recruits in. That's, that's how my mom rose through the organization. She was in recruiting. And she is a very persuasive person. She's good at sales. And she, similar to Robert White, does not have a lot of ethical hangups about the way that she treats other people. Wow. So they were a very good match. Um, she's so sweet. <laughs> like I saw the video of her. She's, she's yeah. such a sweet person. She's just such a nice mom and, you know, caring. Whatever, whatever the context calls for, she will perform. Wow. And and so she came in, I do, I have a lot of compassion for her getting involved with this organization. She came in in her twenties. She came out of an extremely abusive and heartbreaking family situation. And she got scooped up on an airplane by a LifeSpring member, or, you know, maybe at that time it was leadership dynamics or mind dynamics or whatever. Wow. Always be closing, always be closing these guys. And they, I've heard her story of when she started at LifeSpring and she tells it with a smile on her face, but it's a story of exploitation, abuse and degradation until she surrendered completely to them and reached that point of, thank you so much. Everyone who has been nice to me in the past with being fake, you guys have the integrity to treat me how I deserve to be treated, which is trash. And now I'm going to become better according to your program. So she fully, fully, fully believed in it. She believes in it to this day, even okay. after being stalked, harassed and abused by the founder because she believes that- So she believes- are still good. So two two questions here though. Yeah. Uh, so she still believes in it. Yeah. Why did she get a divorce? Why'd she leave the, why'd she leave the, your dad? It was because of the interpersonal abuse and cheating on her and degrading right. her as a person. I think she reached a limit where her the self-esteem that she had developed through the group was at odds with being treated like complete garbage. Wow. Um, where and so but she she was in it for a long long time and i i only existed for the last four years of that they split up when i was four so but she was going through this for many many years before that at least a decade Jeez. and so the way that she met the leader of the group was number one she was stunningly beautiful like yeah I've seen pictures of her when she when she was around the age when she met Robert White. And like, that's one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen in a photograph. And she's so sparkly and bright. She's articulate. She can meet people where they are, which is a great skill for sales. And she did recruiting. So the pitch is maybe you scraped up your equivalent of today of six thousand five hundred bucks you go to the first training and you really need to get everything out of that training that you're going to get because that was the last of the money that you had plus some and so my mom would come in and say and the, all she had to do and there are techniques you know they have books about this all she had to do was make it a fact that if you wanted a better life then you would make the money appear to do the next training and you would do recruitment for free. Wow. And so any reasonable thing that a person with ethical responsibilities to you, like maybe a therapist, any reasonable thing you could say like, well, I need to pay my rent. I could become homeless. 
I have a tooth that's extremely painful and I need to have dental surgery. My child needs a school uniform, right? All of these valid- Valid concerns, <laughs> valid human concerns. Yeah. And taking this seminar where I get like wishy-washy knowledge about my personal potential and how to be effective and dynamic doesn't seem like it matters more than my physical health or my immediate parenting needs. But in a context where if you want a better life, you will get the money, then when you make excuses for not giving them your money, you're wounding yourself. Yeah. Taking yourself out of the game. Wow. And so, so then it seems like all of the dreams that you had about, you know, you get excited, you're in a group, you start thinking, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can go for a promotion. Maybe I can move to a different state, chase that dream, learn the guitar. Yeah. Yeah. Whatever it is that gave you a happy feeling about your future. Suddenly fear is everything because it's all on the line. Yeah. It is over for you if you're not committed. And if you were committed, you would make it happen. And so it's it's absolutely not okay. And right. I just, like I want to be completely clear that those high pressure sales tactics are, are coercion. It doesn't need to be illegal for it to be wrong. It's not okay to do that to people. It's no. not fair. People's concerns are valid. And it's true if you're committed to changing your life, then you'll find a way, but you find a way in harmony with the rest of your life. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, free on YouTube. It's you go on YouTube of yeah. the rest of your life. You don't have to cannibalize your well being or your financial stability in order to have positive things happen for you. So pushing that narrative, I think is really is really dangerous. Yes, but that's the way that my but it, it was through recruitment, getting people to sign up, spend money, and bring in more people, just like a pyramid scheme. It's just um, sales, sales. Was sales. was was probably eighty percent of the experience, and that's how my mom met the founder. They flew her to Asia, where he was at that time, because they had had so many lawsuits and deaths in the United States. Um. And then they made sparkly eyes at each other and the rest is history. And that's it. Wow. So she just, so how is he not just doing this with like 10 different women? I'm sure he was. I think okay. she was the prize pony. I mean, he was right. married at that time. Like when they met, he was married. Oh, so there's um, the previous four boys that are from, that are from that marriage. Yeah. Three boys from his first marriage, a well, second, a fourth boy from his second marriage. He never married my mom, but they did have to get a divorce because while they were working together, they made millions on millions on millions of dollars, like private jet money, Aspen Mansion. They had the biggest house in the state of Colorado, not just it's in the town of Aspen. They so had, your mom was like not just a pretty face. She's a closer. She's big, oh, she's a closer. closer. She's bringing in money. She, you know, this mm -hmm. always happens with these cult leaders. It's like the 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 woman yeah. is doing the real work, like Osho and Sheila. I don't know if you ever saw Wild Wild Country. Matanan Sheila, my Ma -na -na, favorite Ma -na -na. friend of me. <laughs> I, <laughs> I have her I have her sound effects. I don't know if you can hear the sound. I, what can I say? <laughs> Tough titties. Tough titties is my Tough favorite titties. one. How did you know? What a gift. Thank you. Yeah. What can I say? Tough titties. Yeah, I got her on the sound. I love her. She's a firecracker, that <laughs> Sheila. She's wild, um, eh? She's wild. The Patels so, are very proud of her. My cousins still say it. They're like, Sheila, she's Patel. But Patel. I'm like, she's a cult leader. She's, she's I psycho. I think that I think that if my if my mother had had the desire to lead a cult of her own, she would have done an outstanding job. That's yeah. She seems very sweet. It's like this is the curriculum that she's given, right? Like that's the mm -hmm. problem. Osho, he has incredible teachings, but then if you de like the recruitment sales package, that's just abusive. Like that, like day or like session two. But it do it is interesting how they've gotten it down to such a formula. Like this is, they've been oh, yeah. working on this and they've been working together. Actually earlier, one, <laughs> someone in the comments was saying that, um, Robert White, Robert White, right? Yeah. Was, was working with the guy from Scientology somewhere. Like they used to work together and they crossed paths. Yes. He was asking, oh, here it is fact. Alicia's father, Robert White and Ron Miskovich 
Ron Miskovich, big name in the cult community, father of the current, <laughs> fa yeah, father of the current Scientology leader. Okay, we're both in the MLM holiday magic. Not sure if their paths are across. Yeah, to, did you, were you there for that holiday magic? So I wasn't alive yet. My understanding is that Ron was involved with um, life dynamics or mind dynamics, one of the early versions of, of Life Spring. So His you names basically. Are I know. Amazing. Um, but what, what is interesting is that when, um, when I think it was mind dynamic, leadership dynamics was the first one. This is also it's such boring corporate speak. But when that one split up because of the pyramid scheme stuff, uh -huh. um, one side went off and made the Earhart Seminars Training, EST, which later, it, that's right. what became the Mark Forum, right? Yeah, Est became landmark, and I think did LifeSpring not pull from Est, or did LifeSpring just ma he made his own? Your so you can think of them as siblings with the same parent. The parent right. is leadership dynamics, and then one became ultimately starts the LifeSpring branch of the family tree, and then you have Est. Est was a little bit more didactic. It was more uh, maybe familiar to people who felt at home in school right. being taught by by an instructor in that sort of environment and then the other one the where i come from was more confrontational um more into screaming at you stripping you down naked and making everyone in the room criticize your body locking you in a coffin um they had people who were forced to eat feces there's like it gets bad on the live stream um, side yeah, on the life spring side. And so life spring really say whatever it takes, yeah, um, kind of sadism to it that was like there's no higher purpose than being uh, like a superhuman capitalist, and whatever it takes to get you to that point, we're gonna do it, even if it's torture. Yeah, that's a lot. Okay. Um, actually, this is probably a good time to share this. Uh, I, I have, actually have a good uh, yeah. thing that we can watch right now. This is like a, this is a training. This is actually such a good documentary. <clears throat> it's like 30 minute hinted camera LGAT. Shrouded in secrecy, we find some chilling discoveries. Oh, you are so stupid. Oh, my God. stupid. I don't care if you're being unhappy. Let's go. Stupid. You are. Hours of verbal abuse and breaking people down. Oh, my God. Maintain the ground rules. Oh my god, I would hit the guy. Like I'm not I'm not a fighter, but that kind of aggressive, like do whatever, it would you just like be it's like so physically uh, aggressive on the guy. Um, Imagine being a three year old in like and that's they do this at three. Uh, yeah, at my house for sure. Well, so you, so did you ever overhear like, or so they were doing it to you as the kids, but then did they ever have yeah, like- Yeah, this was a way to live? live. This was a way, like the way that the instructors are treating people, the things that they were saying, I've heard those things said to me, um, this is a way to live. And if you believe that it's correct, then that's how you treat your kids. Damn. So, okay. So we have Life Spring. Life Spring's done though now, isn't it? I can't really find Life much on Life done. Spring. I know that's why I want to make a documentary about it because there's this excellent article in the Washington Post from 1987. I highly recommend it. It's called I Cried Enough to Fill a Glass. And it was the first thing that I ever read that made me say, oh my goodness, I thought this was just my weird household growing up, but they were doing the same thing to adults who paid for it. Wow. Oh my God. Um, you're just so born in thinking like they do this to us because they're our parents but then you grow up you're like oh they do it to other people too that's so crazy yeah that was the surprise for me was that this is what they were actually doing in those seminars because I had only been at the seminars as a kid at the check-in table making people's name tags or sitting in the back for the speech on the final day of the training you know cute kids sitting of in the course. back they put you to work so you're either doing cute kid duty at the front mm -hmm. or you're babysitting your the younger siblings or yep. you're like handing out little cards and stuff right so all of the harsh stuff that happened in the trainings i figured they were a lot nicer to the people in the trainings than they were to us i had 
Well, no they can idea leave. that <laughs> yeah. they that anything um, untoward had happened in those trainings. I thought they were just tacky and weird and kind of embarrassing that my dad was doing that. Right, right. And I didn't like the things that he said about my siblings. I remember that even as a little kid, he was using medical problems and life problems that my siblings had, my older siblings, to get attention for himself oh my or to God. like spin the narrative for himself. And yeah. I could see that it was bullshit. Um, yeah. I, you know how many people like Grant Cardone just had his daughter do so we just saw a, a video like a couple weeks ago, but he, he is it, he does seem like a get rich quick scheme guy. And then the dog, mm -hmm. the kids, they love the parents. It is a little bit like those baby preachers. It's cute, but it's like they don't know anything else yet. So it, it's weird that they're bringing them up, using them in the stories, putting them on stage. Like it, it, it's uh, it's very abusive. And then you all just left at some point. Like at some point they just like they're getting this free labor yeah. out of you. But at seven, like they're just like, listen, you're not. Well, so this is this had... is what the report card is, I guess. Yeah. <clears throat> so they had they had great, intelligent, successful, connected adults doing recruitment and funneling money up to them. So my utility um, and until I was in middle school, they had nanny money. So they didn't need me, didn't need me to watch my yeah, they're killing it. There were nannies. I'm this this is a family with a private jet. Yeah. Multiple mansions. I grew up. Oh, you y'all had prosperity. Well, yeah, because they had the mindset. <laughs> yeah, they had the mindset. Yeah, yep. no, I mean, those were the dream years where you're, you're uh, like, they were probably like still in love, and they're just like, we're killing it. You know, the mom, like yeah. when they first met. It's just like oh, another yeah. boost in 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 Robert's White's life where he's just like, oh, I met this hot woman. We're oh, yeah. moving in. We're having kids. We're gonna make this company and like just build it up. And she's mm -hmm. doing all the work too. Like she's just giving him this the, the whole thing, this extra burst of energy. What? Oh, right. And yeah, she's doing the ideas like she's she's more charming. She's more charismatic. They worked really well together. Oh, and so, so cool. my only utility was to be a success story and to show that um, my father is an exceptional person or he likes to say he's an extraordinary person and which I think is so tacky. Yeah. <laughs> he has a website and it's extraordinary people. Dot com, I think is the website. Oh yeah, let's check it out. But he's the only extraordinary person. There's just one extraordinary person, and it's him. But it's called extraordinary people. And if that's not <laughs> that's such that's such narcissism, it's this absurd. is a narcissist, legit narcissist. No, but, uh, oh my god, what a website! That's a great yeah, website. <laughs> yeah, he. Oh, uh, it's oh my gosh. And uh, just for anybody, if you do peruse it, not that I want him to get like a bunch of website hits, but if you that do can, peruse yeah. it. If you read the positive testimonials about him, um, some of those testimonials are written by, were written, are attributed to people that I know who are people who have personally oh like come after or criticized Robert White. So he puts a testimonial. <laughs> like, so like, if you have somebody that doesn't like you, then you put a, a testimonial on your website where they say how great you are just to stick it to them. Like, haha. Yeah. You hate wow. me but on my website. It says that I'm the best thing that ever happened to your life. Is he even saying like, like, oh, you hate me now. But in 1992, you said that I changed your life. No, no, there's <laughs> it's not even that. It's, it's, it's not there. No, it's a lie. This <laughs> is a lie. This is almost like a Jim Baker-esque fall, though. Like, I, I don't know if you know, you're familiar with Jim Baker. who He sells, no. the, he sells the food buckets. I'll, sh I'll show you a clip in a second. But okay. this is so sad to see this cult leader. And they get what they deserve, these sinners. This guy's taking 30 minute calls. And that's rough. He's so broke. He is I don't know if he is at this moment because it goes up and down rapidly. Right. But um I've heard through the grapevine that he has been like down and out, getting kicked out of apartments, you yeah. know, like no money begging, um, still unwilling to just go get a job, but wow. uh, he's too good for that because he's an extraordinary people. <laughs> He's extraordinary people.com. Extraordinary people. <laughs> His license plate says extraordinary on it. So you know. <laughs> this guy, and and I can already tell, just like I've seen this just so this dynamic so much in Indian families too. Uh -huh. The mom's doing everything. It's like you never he like, was it basically like struggling, struggling, struggling? Your mom comes in, kills it. 
your mom leaves struggling, struggling, struggling. Is that the truth? I feel like I, that's what it is. I don't know. I have been told that story, but, but almost everything I've been told is untrue to some degree. Right. Everything that I've been told by this, whoever the speaker is, it glorifies them and their involvement. And so I have to doubt that at the same time, I know that my mom is more charismatic and she's more of a people person and she kind of gets things done yeah. a little faster. Whereas Robert White sort of has this like, He's so self-important, but also rather bumbling. So think about like a like a Mr. Magoo, but you really, really don't want him to yeah, like survive. The kind of guy who makes extraordinarypeople.com, buddy, you're not. Isn't it amazing? Who, who made this font? The X is like the- what, Well, I'm it? sure he spent good money on it in 2013. Have you seen um, the video? <laughs> oh yeah, well, I mean, let's do it. Have you seen it? No. Oh, great, let's, let's take a look. <laughs> music hello so i'm robert white founder <laughs> it is like the music from like that just apple i guess gives you for free for extraordinary yeah. people author and executive coach today i work with people committed to creating extraordinary results in their personal and professional lives here's a quick briefing on what you can and cannot expect from me should we decide to work together if you're looking for He's a rent a friend I he is trying so he's working He's for the money He's, yeah. He needs money. He's not a star. <laughs> I think he lacks the star power. He's not. It's like, yeah. well, homie, just get a job, bro. But it's too late now. You can't get a job. Yeah. Right? Like, what's the resume? Well, <laughs> I mean, he, he's a one trick pony. He puts, he puts transformational architect. <laughs> and I really love the idea of him applying at like an architecture firm. <laughs> <laughs> transformational architect no he's like i transform human souls but honestly mm -hmm. these people they would just get it take an architecture job they're psychos right like they'll just like i'll take the money oh it's yeah just, no I, there's no lie he wouldn't tell i i could talk for hours and give examples there's no lie he would not tell wow that's yeah but i love how he's like not doing a great job i know it's i'm not, not your well. guy if you need a warm feeling so goes the old joke take a bath though i do ah! get you're doing this is a 1970s like street I joke for, like like motivational like someone told that joke in the 70s and he's oh, just yeah. taking it it's so bad. to be close friends with most of my clients i'm a professional resource my role is to be an interruption i help you interrupt old patterns that get in the way of the success you desire and then we work together to install new positive and result-oriented attitudes wow. habits and behaviors i'm such a great way of saying i'm a brainwash coach I'll yep. brainwash you. <laughs> mm -hmm. It's like, kind of reminds me of like uh, Nityananda. I think he's got a guy at Microsoft. Uh, last episode, we talked about Google has like a cult problem. Like there's like, t there's like a cult infiltrated Google and they're only hiring other cult members. And they're yes. like encouraging and like recruiting inside of Google. But uh, <laughs> yeah, no, this is, uh, this is so sad. This is, right? I remember I was, I was, I was doing stand-up comedy one time. I was opening for this guy who was on SNL for like 10 years great successful guy i don't want to say his name he's such a nice guy but mm -hmm. then um but then i'm opening for him and i'm like so young too it was like new and he's like yeah my wife divorced me and she took all my money so i had to go down the road <laughs> he hated it, it was so i'm not a struggling psychologist or life coach without business experience hoping to make a few bucks dispensing advice i am a serial entrepreneur who created two training industry success stories U.S.-based lifestyle. Oh, this is so desperate. Oh Experience or just old? You choose. <laughs> Buddy, you're out of the game. Oh, yeah, yeah. He's so silly. Oh, that's so sad. Because, you know, you can just see the insecurity here. It's like, yeah. all right, I got to. Oh, like, he's writing this the guy behind the camera being like, give it some pep. Give it some pep. Because Eesh. this is not his normal communication style. He's usually pretty sleepy. Really? So. Yeah but like sleepy authoritative, like it works for, for a lot of people, but somebody was behind the camera pushing him to be so much more energetic than he was comfortable with. And he wow. is, he's like, he's trying to follow that bouncing red ball and it is just not working. He's level 11 right now. This is level <laughs> 11. Ah, oh, man, you should have just been nice Spring, to your wife. An Asia-based ARC International <laughs> with over 200. Like if he was just nice, 
You, he, like, you could have. He be. He's not capable. He's just not capable. He's not psychologically. And I'm like, I'm saying this with no judgment at all. Like, I have my own personal feelings about it. But this statement is just true. He is not psychologically capable of being considerate, of being a regular person, of being kind. He cannot. He won't. It's, it is past his ability. He is pathologically narcissistic to a point where yeah he he can't have healthy relationships in his life he doesn't have a relationship with any of his eight kids he oh like do, do you want to hear a sad story a little tell bit me, of a tell sad me. tell me so one of my brothers died a couple months ago and he died in really tragic circumstances in san francisco and the San Francisco coroner did not have contact information for his father, Robert Way, my dad. So contacted my third oldest brother, one of the, one of the original three. Okay. Contacted my, the, so the coroner calls his, Robert White's third son and says, so sorry to tell you that last night, you know, your brother was found dead. And so then my brother reaches out to the other siblings um, because he's the one that's in touch with the most other kids. We're all very separated. That's how we were raised. And so he texted me. And that's how I found out that my brother died. And he also texted my older sister, who is probably the nicest and most responsible person I've ever met, and then also let the other brothers know. And then somebody else told my little sister. And so you have now seven surviving kids. Not one of them was willing to contact my dad to tell him that his son had died. Oh. I haven't talked to Robert White in like 12 years now, maybe more than that. Um, but no one wants to talk to him. No one wants to invite that chaos and abuse into their life. He is so antagonistic. He's vindictive. He's dishonest. He's, he will steal money from you. He'll come on. He'll just, Oh my just, God. Oh my, I, he said like 20 okay. bucks on the table. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Like he set up a kid's the... saving account Okay. with me when I was a kid and I'd like put my, you know, my, save up my little dollars in there right before I turned 18 because he's still on the account because I was a minor. He emptied out the bank account. Uh, all so your all of my money that I saved for college was gone. How much There's was it? There's nothing left in the account. How much was it? Uh, probably like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars. Oh my god! Because I like I started working i started shucking stables cleaning up horse horse poop at like 12. I well, okay so, so you left like you they put you up for adoption at some point so you weren't even with your like like before 18. so my my older brother was put into foster care at four then put back into foster care i think he was 11 and he was basically fired by my dad just told like sat down this isn't working out you won't be in this family anymore. Oh, oh my God. He fired the son. He fired, yeah. So he fired That's my real brother. Donald Trump of him. That's so Donald Trump. He's and like then, with his family yeah. too. I feel like they're the same person, to be honest. Um, so similar. Like, I mean, the way have you ever seen the doc the, the TV show where he made them all apply for a job with him? Or like he made them all on the show, like tell him like, so tell me why you think uh, I should keep working with you. And his own kids had to be like, Well, um, you're my father, but I think you're a great leader and a great CEO and I love working for you. And I want to be like you, dad. And with I unlimited you. access to capital, Robert White and Donald Trump are the same person. Right. Um, but, uh, and then my little sister was seven. I don't know if they told her anything, but she just went in foster care and that was that. Um, and uh, she went least, into- At least her brother got an exit meeting. She just got like, yeah, they're, they're both, here to get you. Just go. They were both given to a pseudoscientific- ultimately abusive organization that placed children um, according to a really, really, really messed up way of like the pseudo psychology and children died there. This is so if you want to look up 
uh, the evergreen, I think it was called the evergreen attachment center, but attachment therapy. This is the stuff where kids would be like wrapped in tight blankets and then compressed to simulate coming out of the birth canal, but would die during what? the process. That happened to my little sister. She didn't die, but that happened to her. It, I mean, they did, they did cr crazy things to me, horrible things. Oh, so there. you went there too. Oh yeah. All of us, because all of us were misbehaving according to the parents, right? We weren't, we kept crying and complaining, getting disgusting loose teeth in our mouths. According to their standard, they're like, these kids are trouble. So then they can apply to a program that's like, I need a, someone. I mean, I, I have heard of this. There is a thing called, um, we had a guest on actually. He said he did like three, four years. I kind of went to one of these two actually in India. It mm -hmm. was like so strict, like they were like abusive and stuff. But this yeah. guy was saying that here at Paris Hilton went to the one that he was at or something too. And they came to get yeah. him and they just like pull you out of the house. They like strip oh, yeah. you down naked, like Awful. hose you down. So I think what it comes down to is parents who are not providing a safe and healthy environment for their kids. So parents who are not doing a good job will find treatments for their kids that challenge the kids and not the parents at all. So a healthy, ethical psychologist is going to say, your kid isn't getting their needs met. That's why they're acting this way. We need to you change blame the, the parents. family. And the parents have to be responsible and have to change. And if you don't want to do that, you end up with this fringe shit, like attachment therapy, where the kid is the problem 100% of the time. And if the kid is the problem and the kid doesn't respond to the therapies, you can give them your kid. So that's what happened first to my brother, then to my brother again, because he came back and then he got fired. Then to my little sister. Then my older sister said, we're both on the chopping block. I'm getting out of here wow. now. So let's, she let's found, oh she found somewhere for her to go. She found a residential boarding school and fought tooth and nail to get to that boarding school. Of course, Robert White said he would pay for it. Then he didn't. Then she almost got kicked out. It's like this whole thing. It's he's always, it's always he's not going to pay for it. But she was able to finish out her adolescence in a safe, sane place. Right. God. So she went away and then I was the only one left. And so I knew like, if I, you know, if I'm, if I continue to be a problem, I'm out, I'm gone. Right. And so when I was 13, uh, it was my, it was my time to be, to be kicked out. Um, so instead of being put into foster care, I was sent to go live with Robert White alone. We had spent summers and holidays with him, but I had never just lived with him before. So I finished eighth grade and then the uh, I moved to where I had spent holidays and summers, what feels like my hometown, um, where Robert White was living. I lived with him for a couple months and this is how I got kicked out of the group. I... This was like the week I started freshman year of high school. I came upstairs one morning because my bedroom was in the basement. I come upstairs one morning in this rented apartment and all the rental furniture was still there, but everything else was gone. Like all of my dad's clothes were gone. His oh suit my God. Gone. Talk Shoes about abandonment. There was, there was half a diet Sprite box in the fridge and nothing else and just silence in the house. So, so if someone says to you, like, I think I have daddy issues. I think I have like attachment issues. You're like, shut up. You don't know anything. Like, that's No, that's of course not. No, that's if somebody intense. says that, I'm like, I, I yeah, know. how many, me too. How you're many like, yeah. men like A, B, and C have you dated? And I'm right, so glad okay. you're still here. <laughs> but that's, <laughs> that's like from the dad. <laughs> I mean, so he I left. He was like, "Forget this kid. She is annoying." You're 14, you're 14 at the time. Yeah, I had just turned 14, and uh, what was I going to do? Pay rent for the next month? I think there was like a week left in the apartment. Um, so, so you left your money in this joint savings account still? So you're still using this joint savings account that you both had? I didn't. I, it didn't occur to me that I could access that money or that that money Fair. even existed. 
Fair. because I had been paying money into it like when You're I had still, a summer job and otherwise yeah. I didn't, I didn't think of myself as somebody who had a bank account. I, you know, hey, I you're 14. Like, you just, you, you just yeah. don't think your dad's going to steal your <laughs> child savings account money. You just don't, it doesn't, so, it doesn't cross your mind, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Damn. So I got some grocery money from sent from my mom, wherever she was living at the time. And, uh, was in the beginning of my freshman year of high school and was homeless. Oh my God. So you send your mom. That's how I got out. That's how you got out. Wow. Yeah. They, they left. They, I mean, yeah, no, that, so, 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 so you call your mom your, and you say he just left and your mom goes, this city, like, is she, is she mad? She's like, he left. Well, I didn't call her. Oh, you didn't call her. Okay. I didn't want to be anywhere near her. I didn't. Um, she has again, she's she's really good at looking out for number one and her interest in in her kids was i think she had a lot of resentment that she didn't have the money through life spring for us to have nannies taking care of us she had no intention of interacting with her kids or raising them she was disgusted by us she told me many times that i was repulsive what uh, to her and to other people. Yeah, she's she would so call on... she called my friend in middle school to ask what was wrong with me, like why people didn't like me. And my friend was like, um, she's just, she's my buddy. Uh, I like her. There's nothing wrong with her. <laughs> we get along just fine with the kids so at school. When, when you're you know? 13, she calls and like, why is she so weird? It's like she's gossiping yeah. with kids or something. Like she's a go she's like right. joining in some high school or like some pre-high school gossip. Yeah. With your but that's friend, how strong her belief you. was that I was defective and repulsive. Wow. She saw it. She didn't anticipate that my friend was going to be like, what? We just go to middle school. I don't know. There's nothing wrong with her. She, I mean, she doesn't like the Backstreet Boys or sync. That's the best that I can tell you. Wow. And your mom's like, no NSYNC. And that's so but I think my mom was expecting to talk to my 13 year old friend on the phone yeah. and hear like, oh, yeah, everybody hates Alicia. Yeah, she's so always complaining when she gets hurt or like, you know, like like they like they just they're so bra the brainwash is like a disease because it's yeah. it infects your mind. And then oh, yeah. I guess it you just keep going with it. So like she's believing in it, I guess. And she yeah. just yeah, that's so weird. So she didn't want me back either. Like if I if I had called her she would have let me move in with her out of a sense of responsibility, probably legal responsibility for me. But my goal was to stay where I was living, keep going to school. I had friends there. So I was sleeping outside, trying to have slumber parties with friends, but then their parents want to talk to your parents and make sure it's okay. And I couldn't make up enough lies to create housing for myself. So then I ended up going into what throwaway kids and runaway kids get thrown into, which is the places that are willing to take you without having a relationship with your parents are the places where you're not safe, oh my but God. you are sleeping inside. Yeah. And it's cold there? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's winter nine months a year. Okay, so you have to live there. So, so, did, so you, didn't go to, you didn't go to that, though. You, you stay after your dad left. What you didn't you didn't take over the apartment because it's like you got to pay a lot of rent. Yeah, I packed up my stuff. You packed up and you went to the foster home that was for. No, I no. never went. I never, unlike my brother and sister, I was never in the foster system. I I created my own foster family where there was a family and like this is who I'm grateful to. This is who made the difference in my life. Um, I actually got to see these people uh, a week ago. I got to go back and visit. There were two families that said, we're aware of your dad. He makes the hair stand back or stand up on the backs of our necks. We know there's something wrong. We know that you're not okay and that you're not safe and you don't have anywhere to live. So we're gonna let you stay with us without parental approval. And we're just gonna hope that it goes okay. And I stayed with each of those families until they financially couldn't support me anymore so i think it was a month or two with the first and then several months with the second wow so they were like poor too but how'd you meet them 
through friends, friends from school, friends friends from my summer job. The first person that I moved in with was my boss from my summer job. And again, being a, a kid who didn't have, you know, parents that, that, who made sense to people. Um, so I moved in with my boss who I had been working for at 14, but I had been working for him for a couple of years. And he is like this famous pervert who like only hired cute little teenage girls to work at his summer day camp and is a total creep. So I famous moved in- pervert at that time. And yeah, in, in like in that neighborhood, everyone knew. Yes. So that's who I moved in with. Oh my God. Because that's what I could do. And then I'd stay with other people for a couple of days or a weekend here or there. I started sleeping at parties. Um, but you know, again, 14 years old, going oh to parties in their early twenties and then staying over, you just are put in a dangerous situation after dangerous situation. So this compounding vulnerability so is happening. This- And my experience of the whole thing was, this is 100% my fault. I created all of this. If I can do better tomorrow than I've done today, I'll stop getting hurt. I'll stop being homeless. I'll be able to be an adult. I'll get emancipated. I'll have a job. And, you know, then I'll get that. I'll be like what I should be. I'll be Mary Kate and Ashley Olsen one of these days if I just stop screwing up. Oh my God. So of That's course I didn't call my mom because what was she going to tell me that I was a failure? I already knew I had failed at being an adult and living independently. Oh my God. That's terrible. But so this, this pervert you're living with him, like, mm-hmm. is it, I mean, I don't know if, if you don't feel comfortable answering, it's fine. But like, did he do anything? He like, I, he tried, I think that he tried harder with other people. I, he, I know that he did worse to other girls that I know that much. I'll say I was very uncomfortable in his home. I ended up being kicked out. The reason that he gave was that I was not grateful enough for being there. Okay. Um, That's his move. That's it. It's that's it. That almost could be like the move of like, you know, you should be all over, like, you know, you should be jumping on this or something. And then it's Mm -hmm. like not, and then he doesn't. And then, so he's just like, you can leave two months, two months. I didn't give him the kind of attention that he wanted. And that was unacceptable. So I was out. Um, And so then my quality of life and my safety was determined by random young 20 something men. And it was like everything that I experienced was purely up to how virtuous they felt like being that day. And that was my life. So like I was basically everyone's just trying to everyone's trying to hook up with like everyone's trying to wants to hook up or whatever yeah. like these guys in their twenties. Yeah, or or do or have permission to do violence. So like to be sadistic. So it's like you can stay at this party, but you have to let them all put cigars out on your legs. What? Or like, oh. Yeah, or like you can stay here tonight, but you have to be the entertainment. And what am I going to do? Go out into the snow? It goes up past my knees. You know? So that was that life until eventually my mom got wind of how long I had been living just bouncing around this small town. um, And had worn out my welcome with my former boss. And so... That was when she said, okay, you're, you're going to move to the city where I'm living and I'll like, I'll take you back. This experiment of getting rid of you didn't work. You're almost out of high school. Move in with me. I don't want you here. So just don't be too much of an ass. Um, and then I was very much an ass. <laughs> okay. And I left uh, right after gra- high school graduation, but it was really understood from from that point, that summer after eighth grade, it was understood that I was not towing the line, that I didn't believe, that I thought it was all BS and that I was really angry. And so I did move back with my mom um, at for the end of high school, but there she never like tried to involve me with her belief system. Um, it was sort of a, 
Yeah, like you're over that now. An but unsteady she was doing that. in the house because she was still 100% in. She's 100% in. So she's yeah. like, according to the training, I'm not even supposed to talk to you. Right. But we had a detente where like, I won't make fun of your beliefs and make smarky remarks and you'll let me live here. Okay. Because somewhere That's in there, good. they know when you, when you rip them on their dumbass call, yeah. somewhere in them, they're like, you shut up. Like, they're just like and so mad at you. Nobody, I'm pretty sure this is true for everyone. No one can rip you apart more deeply than your children. Oh yeah. They really know who you are. Oh, they can tear you down. Yeah. They can hurt you really in the end. It makes it scary to think about creating children because like these people are going to know you inside and out yeah. in all of your most challenged moments forever. Oh, yeah. And if, if they, if they don't like you, you're going to have a hard time. I mean, feelings. it's honestly the reason to have the kids is mm -hmm. so when you're old and vulnerable and sad and miserable and like your body hurts, you have these daughters that come and they go, dad, I love you. Like that's what you need. That's like the yeah. first time I thought I should have kids is when I see my my dad as he was like getting sick and like dying. I'm like, this is why you have kids. That's like the first time. Right. Until then, I was always like, I'm like, whatever, who cares? It doesn't matter. But yeah. that was the but one the time. The loving like, kindness comes like back to you. And that as an yeah. experience is pretty spectacular, I imagine. Yeah. So, yeah. You get as yeah. much as you put in, though, I guess, because if this right. guy's. You know, I mean, this, this, the, the guy that we just saw here, he's not, none of the kids are going to come see him. I mean, he might have some other brainwashed kids though. No, or no, probably not. No, eight total. And so when, when my brother died, uh, no one was willing to contact him. My mother, one of his exes was contacted. I see uh, she declined there. to tell Robert White that his son had died. And so. Mom didn't tell him. That's why she was like, I'm not, I'm, I, she said, if, if it's me or one of my kids, if it's either I do it or one of my kids has to do it, I might bite the bullet, but I don't want to, because I try not to have this, this really needy, crazy person be involved with my life. And he had stopped stalking her and gone after me. And then after me transitioned to somebody else, I imagine. So she's like, I'm not going to bother that thing that has finally left me alone. So the end of that story is that my mother's current husband who despises Robert White okay. profoundly because he's a good person with a good heart, right. despises Robert White, but has lost a child himself ended up being the one to make the call to Robert White to tell him that his son died. Wow. So can you imagine like one of your kids dies and your seven surviving kids and their moms, yeah. including like will not talk to you and tell you that your son is dead. So you get a call from your favorite ex, like your most <clears throat> coveted ex's current husband calls to tell you Wow. And it's not like your buddies. They don't talk. No, no. They're not cool at all. I mean, this guy's a, it's all, you're already not cool with your ex's mm -hmm. new husband. Like, it's just not a fun relationship ever. But this is particularly bad. So that's just, a snapshot of how well his approach to his personal life yeah. has turned out for him. There's also the a great lesson. The sinners don't prosper. In the end, in the, the end, what great suffering. suffering it is a great suffering. Like when he starts, I mean, it's already just so sad in the video that we saw too. Like he is really working for that money. These headshots too. I mean, he, these headshots oh, are yeah, very like, headshots? like this is a guy that's like, ah, come on, can you hire me? Come hey, on, I'm, not hey, me. I'm a businessman. <laughs> I think that's part of why he wanted to be doing this work in Asia because you can just show up and be Caucasian. <laughs> yeah. And like get a lot of credibility off of that. He yeah, also yeah. had, because because of his money and where he lived when he had money, he had some celebrity friends and he'll like put pictures of them up and be like, yeah. hey, look at this guy. I must be important. And it's like, no, you're truly not. How tall is he? Uh, I don't know. Five, nine. Five, nine. Okay. It's not bad. I mean, I, I've could heard. Be, could be, I'm terrible. I'm short. Everybody's taller than me. So I don't right. really know, but he's not like a six foot tall kind of guy. No, no, no. He's not. He doesn't have not have that career. The charisma's lost. And uh, yeah, no, China is cheating. You know, if you're, if you're like a white guy, if you're like a mediocre white guy over here, you can go to China and you'll be dating like a Senator's daughter and yeah, 
you know, partner in some business. They, I remember I saw an article where they were like just looking for white men to be CEOs of Chinese companies, like to just be on board of directors. Just because it makes it look good. His cousin Greg, get over there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They just need it. That's what your dad. That's what Robert should do. Robert, you got to get in one of these corporations. I like his his company. What's that? But it has to be his company. He needs to be the most special star. He just won't work for another person. No. Wow, it's so. I remember thinking as a kid, like when I was, because I didn't have enough money to to go to college, and I really wanted to. Um, and I had gotten a scholarship, but it wasn't a full scholarship. And um, there's a whole thing where he scammed me, like got me to pay a loan for him where I like lost $6,000 on that. It's like, that's the last time I fell for it. Um, oh, you sent him cash. So you sent him a little cash. I Yeah, it was like, he oh, said, bless your heart. I You're will so pay sweet. this, but I need you to co-sign on the loan because you have better credit than me, but I will pay the loan so you can go to school. So I sign up with him for the, I think, $6,000 loan. Okay. Okay. And then he's like, psych, I'm not paying shit. Okay. And then it was like, well, if I want to keep my credit, I'm going to have to pay this money that he said he already had and was going to you know, deposit. And suddenly it's like, no, nah, girl, that like... But but he got what he wanted because in a trade for him taking out a portion of a college semester cost and loans for me, I had to go to dinner with him. I had to like give him the dad experience that he wanted. Um, oh my and, God, yeah. what a transactional guy. Okay, wait, wait, so, so, so just, just explain this weekend. Did he get you to take out a $6,000 loan and then he jacked it? Or he just was said he was going to get pay back the loan and he didn't pay it back. Did he take it and I had to pay it back, or did I? I think I think it's the, I think it's only that. Thank goodness that he promised to pay it. He yeah. promised that I would never make a payment on it, and then he just disappeared. I he think that's what happened. Okay, okay. I wouldn't put him past put it past him for him to be like, oh, deposit the loan amount in my account, and yeah. then. Well, when you turn 18, he did jack you for like a good 15, 20 K out of the savings account. And my siblings and my siblings too. And then, yeah. And then would like string us along and demand performances out of us in order to get payments made toward that amount that he had taken. He stole like a quarter of a million dollars from my mom when she, you know, had that kind of money post-divorce. But anyway, the mom I see, like they built the business together and she did all the work. So, I can yeah. just see them breaking up and your mom being like, just take, take an extra 250 K just disappear. I don't want to do it. Well, I mean, anymore. but he was, he was, he was hell bent on punishing her um, and making her life miserable. Even if, even if she had given all of the money that she had a claim to away, I'm sure he would have found a way to be sadistic and abusive. It's a thing that if you're into the terminology of it, if you learn about the malignant narcissist right. and the way that they'll fixate on a person who they believe has wronged them and make it their job mm. to torture that human being and take everything away from them. He, he had that laser light focused on her for a while. Yeah. But I remember thinking, dude, you're, if you're like, you're complaining all the time about being broke. Do you have any idea how proud I would feel if my dad went and got a job at McDonald's and like, was like, it ain't much baby, but I am going to send you a hundred dollars a week. And you know, like that would have meant everything to me. That is a real loving kindness approach. Everything to me. In in the end, we all, we only want love from the people in our family and we can Mm -hmm. have it so easily with nothing. It's like you have almost unconditional love available to you. But his mm-hmm. ego is so twisted that he thinks yeah. the only way to get it is through his stupid cult. He's so just obsessed yeah. with this cult, I bet. Like, you know, I've, I've seen so many dads like this, too. They do this with their business or something. Right. Yeah. It's it's not unusual behavior. It's an unusual circumstance. But, like, nothing about my family is that unusual. Like, when I talk to other people who just come from messed up abusive families where everybody's really wild, it's like... Yeah. The stories are pretty much the same. There just wasn't a bizarre corporate structure happening alongside it. But the stories are the same, man. Like very relatable. Yeah. It's not that unique an experience, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Honestly, like even even with where I'm from, like everyone's like there's a lot of brown people around here. And 
I tell guys like, you know, you have like a, a white or a black deadbeat dad and they leave. But with the Indian deadbeat dad, they just stay in the house and you have to take care of them. And I know a lot of people who did that. Like the dad would go mm-hmm. take out loans and go yeah. broke. And then he's just like, well, your turn. <laughs> you figure it out. And yeah. the kid would just be paying rent and mortgages and stuff like that. I had a friend, I had a friend growing up who was first generation. His parents were from Pakistan and his dad kept scamming people. So like the family had to pay for it. So they lived in this huge house, but there was no furniture in the house. I should close this door. There was no furniture in the house. And like the family was broke. I don't know the whole circumstances. This wasn't one of my super close friends. Right. And certainly not even the experience of all my friends whose parents, you know, were Pakistani. But like, I just remember this thinking like, the audacity it takes to be the person stealing and then lay in your recliner every night in the living room, just like bring me stuff, yeah. make my life work. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. That's wild. Aren't you aren't you embarrassed? Aren't you ashamed? They become that- alcoholics usually. Like, I mean, I, I have a couple of friends who like the dad at one point said, I gave it a shot, couldn't do it. Now you do it. And they just give him a bottle of Johnny Walker every month or two a month. Mm-hmm. And he That's sits in a room by himself and he's like kind of bitter and yells at everyone, yells at them if they do come in. And that's it. It's all. And, but it is all this weird projection of like, it's your guys' fault. You idiots. You screwed up. And this is why you're never going to make it. Your mom did this. And it's like, they're all just working for him. Oh, yeah. And somehow he would have been what he deserved if not for them. Therefore, they owe him a lifetime of service. Yeah, yeah, it is a weird thing. They just, it's all twisted in their head. Yeah. That's what it you just can't so win. Sad. It does, it is so sad. It is so sad. Let's uh, let's go to this. This is actually very interesting, I feel like. Um, what else did you want to, is there anything else you want to tell us about the thing? I, I wanted to go over to the Ginny Thomas thing and. Um, yeah. Yeah, Let yeah. Me and, see. and the Roe v. Wade overturn. Oh my God, it's so stupid in America. That is such a big brainwash too, I feel like. Oh yeah. <laughs> The oh, whole, yes. like, anti-abortion it's thing. It's crazy. The same tactics that have built these these cults, you know, have have built this Movement. fundamentalist resurgence. And, yeah, it's the same, it's, it's the same tactics, just yeah. used toward different ends. Um, I think that, well, if we talk about Virginia Thomas, I think we will get in a little bit to just some of the core beliefs of Lifespring. So I want to be sure to hit that. True. Um, oh yeah, let's let's get into core belief. Yeah, core beliefs is good. I mean, uh, I guess we haven't. Did we did we talk about the curriculum? Because I am always fascinated with curriculum. It's like mm-hmm. they have really designed a brainwash machine, kind of yeah. like Dantalian Jones over here. This building your cult book. It has a lot mm-hmm. of like it is very step by step, and you know, um, like just kind of breaks everything down into like little pieces of like what the psychology is and how to get people like what, uh, what, what would you say the breakdown is of, of the, of life spring? I've tried to get the binders. Cause I remember binders of, of like these instructions and step-by-steps exercises right. when to do which exercise with a group to solve which problem or get them to which stage so that they'll sign up for the next thing or that they'll say yes to something extreme like, like beating someone or stripping naked or you know whatever you're going to get them to do what activity do you do three times before that it's like chess right wow you're- it's a three yeah. It's down to like, this is the activity. You do this three times, then you can take them to another level. Then do that and push mm-hmm. them. Yeah. So I've tried to find that and I, I've tried to find it online. I've tried to, tried to find it in old family boxes. I have a box right next to me of, of this this era stuff, but I haven't been able to find any of the this material that wow. was their intellectual property and their treasure. But it's the same shit that William Penn Patrick wrote that helped uh, inform Scientology. It's all the same shit as Nexium. Um, large group awareness trainings and the human potential movement are all just different versions of really, really boring, mediocre quality source material. It's so sad. Um, because there's such good teachings out there. Like loving kindness yeah. teachings are incredible. And they always steal that and they put it and they just twist it around to use it for brainwash. And there's always good stuff um, yeah. in there. But one thing that I did find 
uh, on Rick Allen Ross's website, culteducation.com. There was an academic paper that somebody wrote, when did they write this? 1983, so it's old, but two PhDs um, in psychiatry, is it psychiatry? Yeah, um, wrote, like if you wanna look at a, a breakdown of it, the best that I have found is this article they wrote, Pathology as Personal Growth, a Participant Observation Study of Life Spring Training. Um, but I think the best that I can um, describe, like I think Pathology as Personal Growth, the article goes into much better detail than I could. And honestly, with... So this gets into like these detailed mechanics of like, okay, if you tell them to, uh, if you if you make them lie twice, then they'll be willing to slap someone on the third time. Like they have this like rate right. broken down into step by step. Wow. Yeah. Pathology and, as personal growth. This is the article right here called Education. Yes. Account. But I just think of it as here's a list of techniques to make people feel like they want to impress you. Here's a list of techniques to make people feel like they've been totally broken down and they're worthless. And then here's a way to create this illusion of building them back up. You don't actually build them back up. That's something that a person does in therapy over months and years, but you build them back up, which is you give them community, positive, exciting experiences in rapid succession. And wow, then that's bombing. when you get them to sign up for the next thing and to recruit more people. What a so it's system. a pretty simple process. Yeah, and and it's so close to like, you know, I'm just trying to plan my first live loving kindness meditation and I want to do so many fun activities, but like this is this is wild. I mean, like the the idea of like going even beyond one thing, like I just want it to be like a a, a fun time. But right. like this whole thing of like I guess, you know, it how I guess it would be very similar to auditing cuz isn't auditing this yeah. process too? Do you, do you know auditing? I do know auditing in Scientology. Yeah, auditing, it helps, it achieves so many things. One of them is getting that good, good blackmail file filled out. Yeah, that's also, next level. You're, you're desensitizing people to events that they've had in their life, which kind of mimics healing, but isn't really healing. And But you're also putting people through something traumatic and uncomfortable where they're trapped in that situation. They can't escape not without social consequences at a, at a bare minimum. And on top of all of that, to my understanding, these auditing sessions would go for so many hours that you become so fatigued that you start to just succumb to whatever they say and you surrender. And it's said like on the board of the life spring training when you come in that the three values are surrender, 100% commitment, and I always forget the other one. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're like, they're like, spontaneity. spontaneity. Spontaneity, which is really, when I hear spontaneity, I'm like, oh, yeah, that, that sounds great. Like, I'm going to go run in a field of wildflowers listening to Queen. Like, it's going to be really amazing. Want they want you to be spontaneous within their, like, spontaneously so spontaneous give me money. Like, <laughs> is don't think, don't think about it, just do it. Right. Don't I think thought it was going to be loyalty. Just do it. And so yeah. spontaneity becomes a very narrow yeah, no, experience no. that just means that they're removing your natural protections against making a shitty decision in the moment. Yeah, um, no, that's wild. That, that, you know, but, at least at least it was that, though. I thought the third one would be like loyalty or something. Because what was the first two? It was like, it was like commitment, loyalty, no, submission. So like first submit submission. to me. Yeah. Um, and then there's like what commitment? Uh, one hundred percent commitment, which I remember hearing that growing up, like that regular people, people that didn't get it, they don't know what commitment means, and none of their commitments are one hundred percent. So they, it'll take half a day to define what a hundred percent commitment means, but it basically means unquestioning, enthusiastic obedience, no matter what. Oh. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. So that's mission obedience and uh, putting their decision-making ahead of your own decision-making is spontaneity. Yeah. Spontaneity. So those are the yeah. Tactics. Spontaneity is, yeah, it is, it is like you spontaneously just being like, I'll, I'll do whatever you want. Like I already want to do that. 
Yeah, I think what they really mean is immediate compliance. But if you call it being spontaneous, I... then it they sounds like just... you're having fun. Yeah, no, sp- they don't even know what it means. They spontaneous means like I tell you to do something, you go, yes, go, let's go. Like, yes, sir, let's let's yes. go. I say, yeah, go. I say how high. Exactly. I was going to say spontaneous means saying how high very quickly. Very quickly. I need to jump immediately. <laughs> they're uh, just like rewording it. Like, there you come in and like, look at that. Very spontaneous. <laughs> mm-hmm. Like, on the first day, they're just like teaching it. That's so wild. Yeah. Because because compliance as a word sets off red flags, but spontaneous doesn't. Right. And um, so LifeSpring is not active anymore. No, so sad but... for Mr. White. <laughs> Yeah, he's so ooh, sad. He's had he to run so be... many smaller scams and he's I... just like never had his former glory. No way. He's replicated. it's only cuz the mom. This is so typical. This is a typical it is such a typical dad like delusion. Like in his head he thinks like, "Oh, he probably think, you know what he probably tells people like, if it wasn't for my <laughs> wife, I'd be a millionaire." And it's like, "You idiot, you'd have nothing without your wife." I guarantee your mom did everything in this company. I'm I'd say it's a safe bet i wasn't there he was successful when she met him but also people like him will always surround themselves with effective professionals to i mean and there's nothing wrong with that you have you surround yourself with people who fill in the gaps that you have right so you can all like work well as a team um but i certainly haven't heard him give credit (laughs) to no somebody way. else that would be absurd no you can tell from um, the video he doesn't have the sauce i mean when you start putting in like you got to have a lot of sauce to be a cult leader i mean you got to have a incredible confidence i mean you're coming yeah. out with a vid- with a thing that's like a- am i old or experienced you decide it's like ah, baby it's not gonna happen no one's in the room this. working with people not just speaking to a camera making like a commercial for himself he, I don't, I don't want that to be the takeaway for his affect because it does a disservice to people who were charmed by him. He can be okay. very, very charming. He right. can absolutely be likable, come off as important. Um, right. He, he can hold the attention of a crowd. So okay. he is, he's a good public speaker, and that's not an easy thing to be. And a lot of talents of different kinds go into that. But you're still correct that he does not have the special sauce. <laughs> it's not. Yeah. He doesn't have the special broke. sauce. And that's why. Minute, why... Booking? It's not. It's not it. Yeah. Free. If you're giving three free 30 minute at 80, you didn't mm-hmm. make it as a cult leader. You should be just yeah. hanging out on an island. Dollars. It should be. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I've worked in law offices where an attorney charges $1,200 an hour for their time. And that's just a lawyer, not yeah. an extraordinary people. Yeah, not extraordinary people. He got extraordinary people.com. That's that is impressive, though. I know, I love it. And also, you'd think that he would have an army of extraordinary people that he has trained, you know, like these are my here, look at all of all of my, you know, burn the bridges. But but he has to operate alone. He's too old now. I think if we if we touch on Virginia Thomas, it would be a good opportunity just for me to like describe what life spring believes because their methodology is most of what they do. Yeah. But it does have content. Like there are beliefs to it. It's not just strategies to take advantage of you. There is content in, in the belief system. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, you got to have some banger stuff. They're stealing it. Mostly. I heard they stole a lot of it from like Hinduism too. Not to say that Hinduism doesn't have like cults in it. It's, it's really like open source over there. Really, yeah. anyone can start a cult. Um, but I heard they took a lot of stuff from that, too. So they have, mm-hmm. like, really tight beliefs and then mix it in with the brainwash. Let's take a look at Ginny Thomas. I can't believe this is the wife of Clarence Thomas. Supreme this Court. just unearthed footage shows the wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas talking about her past when she belonged to a notorious cult. When you come away from a cult, you have to find a balance in your life as far as getting involved with fighting the cult or exposing it. Jenny Thomas was... That's interesting. We had a lot of people on that are like, I'm out now, but I gotta... Especially because they convinced so many people to join it. You know, they yeah. like feel like I gotta, you know... Yeah. Unproselytize. Mm-hmm. So, so sad. Speaking to a cult awareness group, the year was 1986, one year before she married Clarence Thomas. 
She tried to explain her struggle to escape the cult known as Life Spring. I want to expose Life Spring. I want to keep other people from going through that experience. Before dissolving in the mid 90s, Life Spring was said to have 400,000 members. It was founded in 1974, claiming to help people gain self confidence and control of their lives. But according to former members, some of their so called exercises included having people disrobe and ridiculing their body fat. Oh my God, it's like literally opposite of loving kindness, forgiveness. In loving kindness, you have to love your body, however it is today. That's so brutal. That's gotta be so rough to have this. I think that Ginny Thomas might be the reason why life springs out. Is that true? What do you think? Is that true? I, I'm i I think it was the deaths. The deaths. Yeah. I think it was the people who died in the trainings or because of the trainings. Right, the trainings are too aggressive. She did a lot of activism against it, but yeah, no, yeah. it's can't The eye-opening video was discovered by cult expert Stephen Hassan. And I um, was asked to lead a support group meeting. Thank you, that was great. Hassan serves as that. moderator in the video. She was horrified that she had gotten taken over and wanted to help others. I guess I struggle with he says her background as a former cult member may explain her apparent interest in wild QAnon inspired <laughs> conspiracy theories and the January 6th movement to overturn the election. Others say Ginny Thomas and her husband are being targeted for political reasons. The left is launching another disgusting campaign. To Come on, Justice Clarence Thomas. Who, how do they defend her? She's such a psycho. Just to give a few a little context on this, so she. This is interesting because it's like out of one cult into another cult. That seems so typical. Like this is Jenny Thomas, uh, Virginia Thomas, wife of uh, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, who's on the screen right there, and um, and she believes in QAnon, I guess, and she's working actively in the government to help them and to help overturn the election. Uh, the 2000, uh, I guess, 20 election for Donald Trump. It's, it's wild. I think that Virginia Thomas and I have very different problems with Life Spring. And I think that if she had rejected Life Spring for the reasons that I do in my life, it would be absurd for her to like get into this QAnon shit. But yeah. I think that she didn't like the way she was treated by life spring. Yeah. And so as long as that was the only problem and, and I, I'm happy to be corrected by her, but it seems like the only problem was that it was the high pressure tactics. It was her being hounded, constant phone calls, not being able, not being allowed to quit. She felt like she had to move to a different part of the country to escape them at one point. And that's a very dramatic story. And I imagine it was scary for her. Yeah. And to suddenly realize you've got yourself into a situation where the cost of leaving is that high and that extended is terrifying and must feel very unsettling. I haven't heard anything challenging the belief system of LifeSpring from her. Right. So I think she just didn't like the way that LifeSpring treated her. And yeah. so she left and then she didn't like the way they treated her when she left. So she spoke out. But if she was really against those core tenets of the life spring belief system, if she had excised those out of her soul, she would not be involved with this QAnon crap and she would not have married Clarence Thomas. Yeah, I mean, it is it's it's another one of those failings of like you this is the kind of person that if she joins your cult like you want to get her involved you want to get her in the top you know the top yeah. tier versus like piss her off and then she leaves because she did spend a lot of years like attack like attacking them and and hurting right. them and at the end of the day yeah like the the thing about like conservative uh, judges and conservative politicians is that they're actually part of different religious groups called like I think one's called the family. But they're like different religious organizations that are yeah. that are telling them that they have to pass laws that will help the Christian narrative or whatever. Um, I think that the things that she's doing in the world or the things she supports that are destructive are ideologically compatible with LifeSpring. And so it makes sense that she would slide from one into another.
And yeah. I want to say that with compassion, but also at the same time, I'm really angry at her for making the choices that she's made. And I wish that she had, you know, a different set of ethics and values than she does. Um, but nobody deserves to be put in a coercive situation. And, you know, and the way that she was treated in Life Spring was absolutely unacceptable, full stop. None of that yeah, was okay. Of course. Of course. And have you heard her speak about like the specific stuff that happened to her or is it more like? No, she's been quite private to my knowledge, uh, yeah. or at least in things that, you know, records that you can find on the internet. There's so little about life spring out there. I couldn't find much. I, they're yeah. out of the game. Ugh, so yeah. sorry. Sorry, dad. <laughs> so sucks for him. I mean, he, it, you must feel like shit, you know, like somewhere inside you, you know, that you're caught, you're out of the game, baby. At a certain around. age, it's like, are my, like, he has those delusions of grandeur, but at what point do you say, like, if I'm not king of the planet yet, is it going to happen? Like, a group of his kids, me included, have a group chat about, like, when is he finally going to die? Like, COVID came and we were like, maybe this is it. You know, it's all wow. very sarcastic. <laughs> Just um, like but, Trump, eh? <laughs> You're like, maybe like, he's, <laughs> when, I remember when, when Trump got COVID, I was like, Come on, baby. This could fix everything. <laughs> I've sent fingers crossed, you know, things. Or when somebody else dies, it's like, oh, darn it. You know, a good one gone instead of, and why does so-and-so get to still be here? Yeah, yeah. Um, what, a, what an agent of chaos. But it is sad that, like, I think it's really too late for him to achieve his dreams. So. No, no, it's not going to It's over. It's yeah. over. Uh, there's, there's nothing that's, there's only one like old man dying alone with his oh. dreams not accomplished. Like there's only one, that's the specific flavor of despair that's yeah. really poignant and he is living it. He deserves it, but it's still really sad. It's still really sad. And you know, what's so sad too, is that if he could come to his senses, I bet you would all still like, I bet it wouldn't be hard for like, he just has to get a job oh, yeah. at McDonald's. If he was then, capable of taking responsibility and being honest about what he's done, it, it would be easy. Yeah. And then if he would go get just like a mid-level management job at Staples or something, because he has management experience, fine, just do that and like start yeah. helping people that he's taking money from. If he acted like an ordinary person That's for okay. one year, he could have his whole family and his life. I truly believe that. Yeah, he could have the love that he thinks he's going to yeah. get by starting a cult. It's so messed up. They, it is like psychological trauma, I guess. Like they have just, they're just messed up. Like, but he doesn't want that family experience that I'm describing. That's like, if he wanted it, then he would do it. He would get it. But he doesn't want that because he doesn't yeah. get to be, he doesn't get to hold the reins. He doesn't get to be controlling. Right. He doesn't get to be the best one or right all the time. Yeah. The experience I mean, he's looking for is not one of like a normal loving family member. No, so no. he wouldn't be happy if we were just in his life and he had to be a nice person. He wouldn't be happy with that. Yeah, he would be like boring. I want to be rich and famous. Mm -hmm. or I want to be in charge. I want to have enemies <sighs> and yeah. Yeah, no, what a what a mess. And it's like, but mm -hmm. Do you think that they're so lost in their ego? Like they think that the only way I can get happiness is if I do all this and all they have to do is just reprogram and be like, Oh no, my happiness is right. I'm sitting on a gold mine here. There's a family here. They're ready to go. But yeah, but he just doesn't, he doesn't want that because he's so lost. Maybe, maybe you'll, I struggle. I think about this a lot and I struggle to express it. So maybe you'll have a, a better take on this, but it's like, I think of it as, he does have, he could change, but like he could change to be good, like a, just a very simple version of good. Yeah. Um, he could do that, but he doesn't want to. So he can't do it because he can't want to be good. So can he at all? You know, like he could be different, but he doesn't want to. So he can't. Yeah. So when it comes down to it, I usually say he can't be different because he can't desire harmony. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I guess I guess what they teach in like loving kindness and stuff like that is that he's basically so lost in the illusion 
-hmm. and like so lost in his ego that it's created a distortion of the world that's so deep that he doesn't want the right thing. Yeah. It's like he just he thinks like his family is his enemy and stuff like that. Like it's just a he's so deep in yeah. the game. And Alan Watts, he says this about like, you know, because because it's like uh, in Hinduism, they teach this whole thing of like this whole life is like this game we're playing. It's like a game of loving kindness. We're made of loving kindness. And then we're here and our egos are built to constantly make us forget so that we can remember again. And right. some people are so deep in their ego that they're like evil. And I, I think someone's asking Alan Watts is like, why would there be evil if we're just playing a game for ourselves? And he basically says that like, it's like, if you're watching a movie, it's like a game, like it's like a play, like a movie or like a, a story, whatever. If you're watching a story and it's like 50, 50, good guy could win, bad guy could win. Eh, it's okay. If it's like the guy, good guy's going to win for sure. It's kind of boring. If it's like 50, 50, it's like whatever. But when you get a real evil person, when it's like 80, 90%, like they're going to win, like their evil is just going to whatever. Then you mm -hmm. got a story. Then you got a, like a, yeah. a, a thing. So yeah. in the end, we're all going to go back up into this source energy. And we're just going to look at people like Trump and him and be like, like they're gonna wake up and be like, oh, oh god, I can't believe I was such an asshole. Like they're just gonna wake up in there. Like, as, like, I was Goliath. I thought I was David the whole time. I was I, Goliath, you guys. And everybody's like, yeah. Yeah, you really yeah. got into it. You got you really played your part down there. You, you're you're yeah. psycho. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like it's it, it, it is it, it's it's crazy. Like they're gonna but they yeah, they they could never they can never have happiness. But they're they might just be built like that. Like what can you I tell for him it came from trauma just yeah. like growing up just like a whole lot of people in his generation there was abuse alcoholism you know everybody's parents are traumatized from the war yeah and uh and you you grow up rough some people turn that into uh just a half life kind of a broken half life that you stumble through forever yep. um which makes my eyes tear up just to think about some people have like post-traumatic growth um, that's what I'm going for. And then some people use narcissism or become like psychopaths and they use that to have a world system that works for them. And that was like forged in the fires of, of so a really bad childhood. But again, kids could go through the same thing in the same family or the same thing in a different country and choose not to be that way. Yeah. And um, I think that I think that Robert White has chosen that he's number one so many times for more than seven decades now that there is no other option. And the way forward, even if he tried to imagine what I meant by like if he just acted like a like a regular person. Yeah. For a year, his life would change so much. I don't think he has the capacity to put that together in his imagination wow. because his world is so unfamiliar to mine. And yeah. it, He's too it deep consists in. of power relationships and yeah. exploitation projects. Yeah, well, let's hope he doesn't start laying that on you as like the because because once he starts getting the big medical bills and he's in there, there's going to say, baby i think i love you i think you know i was wrong this whole time like he's i feel like that's why i've been no contact i mean he go he's, no contact. he's reached out to me within the last couple months but it <laughs> it goes like to need the money that okay. that i don't see so i have everything archived in case there's ever a threat made wow. um because he can go a little off the deep end and he can do some stalking so i changed my name that's why i don't right. have the same last name as him anymore since i changed my name the stalking ended and except for like one time where he i guess came to to where i was living came to new york city oh my and God. was going to try and find me but i don't really know how much of a plan he had um but so he can't, he can't plan a trip with your wife he wants to like there's i've built up protections around myself that are so thick that there's no way he can get to me. It's it's amazing. I feel I feel great about it. That's great. Um, That's good. But, I mean, he's out. He's out. Because you got to be careful. He will. I I feel like guys like that. They just come back. They just uh, they just say you know they need a little cash. They need a place to crash. And they go. You, yeah. you forgot about daddy. <laughs> yeah. He, no. He he'll do that to my siblings and his grandkids for sure. And and I hope that everybody will just ignore him. Right. 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 Man. Yeah. So where 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 are you? Um, 
like what what are you doing now is it do you feel like how jenny thomas was saying in the in that video that you feel a sense of like i got to help other people get out or are you just kind of doing your own thing or i, I feel like you are working for community in general yes so who was it that said um i watched one of the I watched one of the live streams and it was so cool. She was so amazing, but I've forgotten her name. Um, Landry. Oh, so, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Nine years with Nityananda. What a psycho. Yes. That guy's a maniac. And she said that, um, I, this is a misquote, I'm sure, but she said that she came out of it with like a higher level bullshit detector. Yes. And I loved that. Yeah. So for me, I don't think my personal mission is protecting people from getting into specifically cults or helping people recover who have been in cults. Like if I get an opportunity to do that, then the, reach out to me, please. I wanna, I wanna listen and commiserate and validate your experiences and tell you that you're great. Um, but what I wanna do is there's a certain kind of bullshit that I see everywhere now coming out of LifeSpring and it's kind of my mission to call out that specific bullshit. So have you ever heard just like in the culture, people criticizing others for like making themselves the victim? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Victim blaming. Uh, like, yeah, it's something that I heard a lot. You were mentioning it, but I hear it a lot in uh, like in right wing circles. Not right wing, like there has been this movement with men. Where mm -hmm. they're like, don't be a victim. That's victim culture. If you talk about any left wing issues, you're victimhood, yes. and that's going to lead to socialist, and then then you're going to be a feminist, yeah. and then you're going to let uh, Muslims take the country or something like this. Like, there's a whole conspiracy I've heard for years from Hindu yeah. conservatives, but also American, obviously. So here's here's how that works. Here's the mechanism that I see at play. If something is, if an injustice is taking place, and it's say it's happening to you. So, you know, for sure that it's real. And you say, Hey, I really love being in this political party, college, workplace, family, yeah, whatever. Um, but so-and-so here is doing something bad to me and he won't stop. I can't get him to stop. And it's having an impact on me. And it's like, like we, I need your help. I need your help. Somebody is, I'm being victimized by someone. Yeah. And then, but and not then, using those words, maybe because it inflames people. But like, if you're being harmed by someone, it's not fair and you need community support to help make there be fairness and well being yeah. for you. You're just victim culture. Then the way to keep the status quo going is to say the problem isn't that person who is victimizing you and turning this into a shitty experience for everybody. Yeah. The problem is the truth teller who is sharing about it. Yeah. So then you get to have a world where instead of jerk guy is ruining all the fun for everybody. So let's handle jerk guy. And then, you know, like, but what if you're the jerk guy? Instead, you can flip the narrative on the person who, who, raised their hand and said, Hey, we've got a problem here. Yeah. Make them the problem or make the act of talking about it at all. The problem. So you'll hear yeah. people saying like, you know, I just don't like how everything has to be racist or classist or sexist these days. Everything has to have a label. And it's like, so what you're saying is you don't want it talked about. Yeah. It's uncomfortable. And I feel I'm saying this because I feel this reaction myself like when somebody within something that i like says hey guy over here is ruining it you think that he, you think that he's being cool but he's not and yeah. it's a problem my first reaction is i don't want to have a problem we're we're the good guys we can't have a problem so my first instinct is like in my own head i i notice it every time yeah that's probably not true. That's probably an exaggeration. Right, right, right. Protect, protect the status quo. You want to protect the status quo. You don't want to rock mm -hmm. the boat. But it's not like I'm sitting there saying, I want to protect the status quo. It's that I don't want this problem to exist at all. Yeah. So I'm going to preserve the life that I had five minutes ago where this problem didn't exist by doubting you. 
Yeah. And I feel that in myself and I dial that back and I'm like, okay, that's about my own comfort and it's not about reality. So let's yeah. figure out what reality looks like. But what I want to do is like in my life to consistently call out this contempt for ordinary people who are being honest about the world around them. So yeah. if I say capitalism does not work for most people, it's destructive and like reasonable people can differ on that. Right. Um, but if somebody says, well, I think that majority rule democracy with capitalism <laughs> is the best option for these five reasons, I'll engage with that. But yeah. you don't really hear that. Um, no, you hear, you hear you, uh, facts you, don't care about your feelings or something. And it's like, I'm it's weird how they project facts. Like libtard lesbian. You know, that's what I get from people. Um, and so, and I just want to be a victim. I just want to have a problem. I'm collecting problems like they're crystals. And it's, yeah. it's, it's like, it's a really easy way to dismiss someone and silence someone. So my hope is that more people will kind of tune in their bullshit detector yeah. to people who are shutting down conversations, people who are shutting down the person who is brave enough to say something. It doesn't mean that every person who says something is telling Has the truth, be, but yeah, I'm telling yeah. you right now, most of them are. Um, it's mm -hmm. like, if somebody doesn't want the conversation to take place at all, that's probably that same impulse that I feel toward wanting my road to be smooth before me yeah. and it's don't crazy. put any bumps in it, you know? Yeah. I call it conservative. I, I know it's not, it is almost like trying to conserve something or whatever, but I do find that conservatives push it a lot. This whole thing of like, you're just in victim culture or like victim. They even go for, it's weird because they, they are projecting in a weird way. They're saying like a lot of times they act like the biggest victim. Oh yeah. Saying that you're the victim saying that oh, yeah. the, like these victim these culture are, are victimized. taking away my Christmas cups. <laughs> yeah. 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 Or like gay rights is taking away my rights. Right. It's, so yeah. ridiculous. it's like it's like you are projecting and it's crazy how even Clarence Thomas, after they after they just overturned Roe v. Wade, he's actually talking now about now we got to consider gay rights, we, uh, gay marriage. And we got to consider mm -hmm. like contraception and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, and the people on their side are just you can't argue with them. They're, it's crazy. Even mm -hmm. on YouTube, it's just nonstop videos like they'll just play a video and it'll be like it's great. I, I hate these new videos. I got to start doing them and I hate them but I got to start doing these because they're so what easy. Is it? It's basically a video where like, okay, you, it's like, it's like called a stitch or a remix or something like that. Like okay. you take a one minute video and then you just play yourself in front of it, reacting to it. So it'll be like one guy, one girl or guy will be like, okay, this is going to end all abortion arguments. So if a life starts at six weeks, how come at eight weeks there's this? And that's why we have to ban abor we have to ban all abortions. And then another guy is just playing that video, but in front of it and saying, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, tell him, girl. And it'll just be like, that's that's the uh -huh. whole video. It's like, right. just play her video or not play it, whatever. But there right. is crazy amount of like- Layering on your reactions. Layering on your reactions. Like mm -hmm. we're on this team. This person put out this piece of like anti-abortion propaganda or whatever. And I'm just going to agree with it. And they do seem like they're living in a world where they feel like victims or they feel mm -hmm. like they're protecting this victim so much. Yeah. So they project this victimhood thing, but really they're acting like it. I feel like more. And then, um, and then, yeah, like it, they're so deep in these arguments. Like you ever hear these arguments? You're like, I can't even, I don't even know where to start on this. Right. Cause you, you work in that, right? Like well, how, yeah. what do you, what do you do with that? Do you ever have to like deal with people who are just like, well, I think that the only, okay, the only anti-abortion argument that I'm like a little bit, where, where I honestly just feel like, well, I don't know what to say, is like mm -hmm. they'll always get someone who's like, I'm a, I, I almost got aborted. Like there's one guy that they had on, on a clip I saw where he has a sign that says, I almost got aborted, but I wasn't and I love life and I'm here for pro-life. That's the only one that I'm like, okay, I, I really don't want to argue with this person either. And like, I know there's arguments against that too, but like they seem almost righteous. Everyone else seems like they're just brainwashed with really dumb arguments, like, but they're so emotional about it. They're so intense about it. Like, how do you deal with them? It's difficult. So I've been doing abortion advocacy in Texas. Um, that's what I've been up to. And it's time for me to leave now. I'm going to go back to New York City. Okay. Um, 
So wait, wait, you've been working, uh, sorry, where, sorry? In North Texas. North Texas in a, yeah. an abortion. So I've been, I don't want to name any specifics, but the goal has been to directly facilitate abortions for people who live within a certain number of miles of me. Um, and then to also just advocate, provide information and resources to anybody who needs them around abortion. Um, so I've been very careful not to break the law, but now the, the range of activities available to me that are still legal is too narrow for me to really feel like i um, doing a good thing. And also there's been like some stuff in my neighborhood making me feel not so safe lately. So I think it's time to pack up. Yeah. So people have done, have they done, have, have you ever been like targeted or harassed for like, why are you helping people get abortions kind of thing? I, nothing out of the ordinary. I've certainly gotten yelled at at public events where I'm tabling, you know, for a nonprofit um, where somebody will come and need to have a very intense emotional experience at me. And that's not about me. It's like they're on a train that has already left the station. And the best thing that I can do is just de-escalate and try to keep everybody That's great. from getting more excited um, and remove that person from the environment and in like a nice, peaceful, smooth way so that their like emotional or mental event doesn't get more intense. Um, it, that doesn't hurt my feelings. It's the everyday comments that get to my heart where people will say like, oh, I'm so happy and relieved to hear about that ruling, you know, from the yeah. Supreme Court or a friend of mine had to sit next to a coworker yesterday and the coworker is crying with happiness um, about the decision. And then my friend has to sit there and just sit with that all day long. And, and like that breaks my heart. That makes me want to cry. That's I sad about any of that but yeah. they're so deep in it doesn't all have to be about changing minds it can be about going out and making like direct tangible action in your community so that's where i try to focus so every time i like get into the despair of the antis i just remember like we've mobilized around this before we can mobilize again reproductive justice and workers rights and human rights they're all the same thing yeah so as we come together as workers as we come together as people who can get pregnant as we come together as people who care about you know reproductive justice and access to abortion especially um access to birth control that'll come under fire all of those things if people do tangible things instead of falling into despair then it's not necessary to get into the weeds of how do we change a brainwashed generation. I think we can remove, like, by advocating, by working together, by yeah. getting power in the hands of the people, we can de we can disincentivize that religious extremism around abortion. Right. So, like, if there's no point to brainwashing an entire generation and generation after of kids into believing that abortion is murder, which it is not, then because those rights are settled, then at least we can take away the reason to put children through, frankly, traumatic experiences that they go through that convince them that thousands and thousands of babies are being murdered. Like, that'll mess, that'll mess you up. That's not Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. They do have a genuine but, feeling of, I'm saving a baby. And are now grown, and they're the people that are writing SB8. Yeah laws here in texas and yeah you know, and these things will travel outside of the united states and so um you think it'll have an influence on other countries because other countries do follow the lead of us but yeah. it seems like less and less now i think we have cultural legislation that kind of follows what works for fundraising for parties here yeah. and then we have economic policies which often do much more harm right. those are really easily exported to canada to australia you know like we're and then and then being sent by force all over latin america and imposed um which is a whole other story yeah. but i think that if like i might get really discouraged thinking about the people whose minds are made up against this human right, but um, 
there are like there are examples all the way through history that I love reading that make life worth living for me, reading about heroes of the past and how they were so brave. And I want to be one of them. And I want to be like that. And yeah. so tomorrow, like there's a general strike for one day, for just one day tomorrow, there's going to be a general strike. And anybody who wants to participate, say, you know, on their email thing or whatever, I'm striking for today for reproductive justice or however you want to phrase it. That sends such a strong message, especially coming from men. That yeah. sends such a strong message that we could start building networks in the United States where like we could have the community support set up for a full general strike. Like it uh, could be within sight that we could yeah. get people through without becoming homeless and without going hungry, a general strike for healthcare, abortion access without apology, and you know, like worker protections. We could do that. Yeah. We can make it happen. But it's if if it's only femme people, um, then everybody will be unsure enough and then not participate. Yeah. So if anybody is up to, you know, join in striking for just a day tomorrow, that could make a huge difference. And if you're not able to, that's cool. I just hope that there's something that you can do other than donating to a major political party, something tangible. I know. It's that crazy that the Democrats are going to. That you care about. And then we don't have to be in despair about any of this because it can just be what radicalizes you in a positive way. Yeah. And it's great. It's interesting. You're saying about how, like, um, you know, you're saying there's so many people that talk about like, Oh, you're just, it's all victim culture. Like it's very, it, it, it is like a lot of Patels too. It's like, we're so corporate that if you do a strike or if you do anything, they just say, well, where's the profit? What's the ROI mm -hmm. on a strike? And like, nobody wants yeah. to do stuff like that, you know, but uh, so tomorrow, uh, what, where's the, where's the, like, everyone just doesn't go to work or is there something? Yes. Why did protests go on after one hour ago? Jeez. This is on NBC. So the plan is that strike in whatever way works for you. Um, if that means telling your boss, this is why I won't be in tomorrow. Um, if it means setting on your email signature, this is why I'm not in today. Um, just whatever you know best what works for you to express i'm not here today for this reason and then if you're able to spend the day at a government building marching protesting connecting with people that's where you might find your organization or your group of people that you're really excited to do something with that can yeah. actually make a difference like find a way to mobilize make connections and going to your local like main federal building or Googling in your area for where the protests are going to be. That's how you find your people. Um, and you know, I'll, I'll be there. <laughs> I'll yeah. be doing it. Um, it's just a bunch of people like me and, uh, and we're, we're going to work really hard to protect each other just like we have since 2016, just like we have since before then yeah. that's all we can do. But I refuse to fall into despair. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. not giving up on anybody. Are you into Marianne Williamson at all? No. Does she, she write poems? So she's incredible. She's like an activist. She might run. She, but she has done a lot of like women's rights activism. But um, her name sounds familiar. But I am terrible at keeping track of who is who and what organization is what. So she's like she's like very politically active, which I love. But then, like very few spiritual teachers are. She's actually very. Mm -hmm. um, She's very like she's she's a spiritual teacher, but she's very politically active, and her spiritual thing oh, that she teaches. Yeah, I know her. Yeah, so she teaches a like, course in miracles. She does meditations from the course in miracles, which is like kind of like a loving kindness, or they call it heart centered teachings. It's is it's she incredible. legit or is she like self serving? You I think she's I mean? so legit. That's why she's like she's like what we thought Bernie Sanders was supposed to be, but not but turned out I don't know. Is Everyone she, feels is, like is Bernie Sanders is, so is she what? Is she, is she a socialist? Yeah, yeah, she's she's pretty socialist. She's like she's very left wing, and um, I'll look into work, her her deal, workers' rights and stuff like that. But she teaches from uh, she teaches also a lot from A Course in Miracles, which is like this. Uh, it is like a loving kindness text, and they basically say in that too that like social activism is it is almost an egoic thought that it's going to be a hassle 
it always looks like a hassle, but when you go into it, it's actually will be life changing. It'll be so beneficial for you, but your brain is yeah. think, making you think that it's not like, just like yeah. any kind of helping other people. You think that like, that's going to be a waste of my time, but actually it's actually, it's, it's, it pays back in dividends better than anything. The ROI and it's a is social actually experience. Better. Like we yeah. need social experiences. We need to, we need to walk and march together just physiologically like that's we don't have the same access to human society that we used to. And yeah. I think it kind of breaks all of our hearts and wears us down. And that's why I always go to sports games when I get invited, even though I don't care about sports is because I love the group energy yeah. and it's not towards something destructive. And so all the better, like be a part of some group energy because, you know, everybody that drives by that or walks by that or sees that you're there, too goes home feeling like they might be a little bit safer and a little bit more protected in this scary world. That's so beautiful that you can give that to people just by showing up. Like, yeah, yeah. that's why I go. I love it. I just want everybody to know that they're cared for. It's, it's it crazy. Show up. It's crazy that we look at a protest and then we look at like a day on the beach and we think it's not that different. No, it's, it's really, really not. not. It's really super fun, especially if you bring water. And if you want to make friends, here's my tip, making friends, because I've been like in a new city and protesting before. Take a trash bag with you and pick up trash when it's done and see like who gets into it with you. And maybe that's your new friend. Wow. Like, that's, that's great. You know, and but also I think the point is to like striking is doing something and making plans at a protest to do stuff, those are real action. But if it's just going to a protest and there's no strike or it, it's just showing up to a protest and that's all to be counted, they already know how we feel. And um, that's not action, but it's an excellent place to find action and to start it. And striking is, I think, the most powerful thing that we have power to do right now. Wow, you're a real radical. Yeah. Pissing off these conservative men. They just absolutely. Yeah, that's great. That's so good. It, it honestly, I, I was brainwashed into thinking that it, it, it's, it's all such a waste and it'll destroy society. It's, it is nuts how like they even look at any protests like, oh, they're destroying society. They're collapsing us and they will the, the social order will break down and stuff like that. No, protest. It's the opposite. Protests keep the social order going. If all we do is protest, then we're just saying, OK, it's fine. It's fine. I mean, obviously, I don't like it, but it's fine. Here we go. We'll just keep doing this. Yeah. It's tolerable to the system. It doesn't disrupt anything. So, again, they already know how we feel. So just protesting, I think of it as sort of a formality. I always go. I want to meet people. I want to see people have their first like baby protester experience. It's so wow, beautiful. That's good. My nephew's but, like action is what makes the power structure allowing injustice. It's what makes them uncomfortable. It's not blocking off a couple city blocks for a planned day of protest. Right. And then it gets one news cycle if that and then we all move on there's nothing disruptive about that at all but it's such a good place to organize and to meet yeah. your new friends to go and meet people and make a plan yeah it's it's so crazy everyone's just making businesses and get rich quick schemes nobody's really doing this oh people and are doing it people are doing it yeah people are doing it people are doing it it's so inspiring it. there is yeah. like i should go, we're in this there. go together yeah we're we're so like we're arm in arm nobody is alone in this unless you choose to to stay alone in this i gotta say a choice you can do it but specifically for the pro-abortion thing i gotta say it is mostly i feel like most conservatives too like i mean we get there's some people in the audience even here that are like obviously anti-abortion but like most people i know even like dave portnoy i don't know if you're familiar with dave portnoy do you know barstool sports no he is like the kind of guy that you might see him as like toxic toxic male or whatever but he came out the same as soon as it was overturned. He came out with a video saying, "Like this is so stupid. We are moving backwards as a country. We need to like this goes against our progress. This goes against like you know being a good, high functioning, efficient society. And we're like we just made a really stupid move. Probably half of his audience hates him for saying it, but right. it's you know I, I got to say like the, the abortion thing specifically. It's such a radical move for them to do. It is really like the Republicans they." 
they're just so relentless. It's like, it's over. Yeah. We won this and they won't, they're just working in the background all the time trying to overturn it. No, dude, they're living an epic adventure story and they're winning. Can you imagine how good that feels? They're killing it right now, right? What they're could possibly it. take you off of that speeding train? They're talking so much shit right now on, you know, like the Ben Shapiro crowd. They're just- It's they, happening. There are plans. I mean, you know, it's- It's too bad. People yeah. are already, already suffering for this. People will die soon. Like it's happening. I mean, if I, in case anybody's on the fence, like if I have a, I have something called uh, factor five Leiden thrombophilia. And if I were forced to carry a pregnancy to term, I would likely die during that pregnancy. That would be that for me. Wow. And they'd make you do it. Yeah. For this law, even in the case of like underage and everything, it's just illegal. It's no abortions. Yeah. And for me, there's no compromises. It's either full access or nothing. Um, but it, it's precisely because everybody's comp everybody's situation is so complicated yeah. in working with funding abortions. Like I've spoken to people who were having very, very late in the pregnancy yeah. uh, abortion procedures because of horrific, terrifying, very sad circumstances that were breaking their hearts and they had to do it. And then they had to go out of state to do it and spend all this money. And that compounded the trauma and their oh vulnerability. So also I'm going to hit you with a sad thing. I know that I've tell been up, upbeat on the abortion. No, you've been stuff. great. This has been great, great episode. And tell me if you got to leave. It's been two and a half hours. Tell me if you got to leave. I, I do have more questions leave. about abortion stuff, but I, I love chatting with you. This is great. Yeah, I got, a, I got a couple more minutes. I think it's something to to lift the mood after my yeah. statistic that I always share. So okay. here's something that I want people to know. I know I know not everyone lives in the United States. The United States is not the world. Like I'm not trying to say that where I live is the center of everything. But here in this country where we're going to have probably a federal ban. Um, so like number one, Forcing someone to carry a pregnancy to term doesn't just mean that they have to go through the experience of either parenting that child or choosing adoption for that child and going through that painful experience and putting that painful experience on their kid. Um, but also pregnancy is really dangerous. The like the health risks are high. The like I was talking to my friend the other day and she's like, oh, yeah, every baby I had took away half my eyesight. Like I can barely see anymore. That's a thing. Yeah, like it's you a hear lot. about this, like took all the calcium out of my bones. I'll never be able to laugh again without peeing my pants. Like it changes your life and your body yeah. in huge ways. Complications. People tend to yeah. think that that means something is rare. Like no, dude. Just no, being mean, a woman in the world. My friends have had complications that are devastating to their lives. Yeah. Like mortality more often rates than not. used to be but, very high. Mortality rates are very high, especially for women of color, especially for black women in the South. Yeah, so it's yeah. not safe to be pregnant. It's a dangerous thing. Like for me with my blood clotting disorder, I could die. With all of that, the number one cause of death in the United States for pregnant women is murder. Yeah. So think about that. Think about what happens when the exact women who are getting murdered during pregnancy are like the women who are choosing abortions. Many of them are, are especially vulnerable to being killed. So we are going to have new murders that were not going to happen before this. So you think it's, it's an issue where like husbands want the abortion and then they're like, yeah, I can't afford this 70%. kid. I mean, it's like, it's because they're pregnant. It's the reason that you're twice as likely to be murdered while you're pregnant. It's the reason it's the number one cause of death instead of preeclampsia or whatever else complications oh in pregnancy God. and childbirth. Yeah. But um, I think it was like 70% of those deaths measured happened within the home. So, you know, it was the dude. Um, I mean, like, it's. I just, I want people to take seriously how intensely dangerous it is to be a pregnant person from a lot of different angles. And just to remember that by far the leading cause of death is homicide if you're a yeah. pregnant person, by far. So like 
we need to be planning for for slaughter in addition to all of the other tragedy. And if that doesn't make it matter to you, then like, I can't, I can't say anything else, you yeah, know? I don't, uh, yeah. I, 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 I think like I, I, I almost just want to tell people who are so into it, like to the point where they feel like they have to make comments or like pull up another video and be like, yes, I agree with this or share it or tell everyone like, or be just excited. It's almost like there, there's this disconnect where I, 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 I wanted to tell these people that like nobody wants to get a, an abortion usually. Like I, I feel like in a lot of cases, it is a tough situation that like we just shouldn't like, it's almost like they're seeing it as like, look at what they're doing. They have loose morals, but really it's like, these are just real issues they're going through. It's complicated. And so it's just happening the way so many deaths happen, like so many like military deaths happen, cars, guns, everything, you know, there's people just die all the time. And there does seem to be this thing of like, we're going to lose our morals. And then mm -hmm. they're, they're just, there's, a, there's almost this propaganda out that like women just do it for fun or something. Right. And that I, I think is ridiculous. And like people just, I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know how to communicate it to people. People are just so like, they think they need to take control of it because yeah. as if leaving, like, you know, it, it's almost becoming a fight of like, Oh, so you hate the babies. So you just want to kill babies. Like it's not kill yeah. babies. It's like, it's more complicated than that. And it's like nobody wants to, but better to just leave it in their control, which is a you, usually you think most conservatives would be into that because they're libertarian in so many other regards. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's 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 all very, very emotional. And I get that. I try not to get into the weeds of of saying, OK, well, what if I convinced you that more a larger percentage of abortions than you think are so-called valid to you because right. I am not invalidating a single abortion ever. If like ever there, there are no compromises on that. It is the fact that you are a complex human being with a complicated life yeah, and that you yeah. get to make your own decisions about who uses your body and for what is it's, it's the same That's as it. my opinion on organ donation. <laughs> you, need, you need consent. You yeah. need consent and my body can't be used to keep anything or anybody else alive without my consent. And that's, that's really straightforward. So I don't want to get into the weeds of, of, right. of having virtuous and non-virtuous abortions, because then we're just, again, saying that it's okay to, to exert this will, like to violate. Yeah, yeah. I, guess, I guess I'm trying to appease these concerns because I'm just like, what are you worried about? Want harmony. I get yeah, it. You man. Want harmony. You just want to be like, what? like, they're not, people aren't just doing this for fun. It's, and, it's 90% of the time, like a tough situation. Yeah. But even if someone doesn't want to have a kid, I, I mean, I that's think that is valid. You just don't want to be thing. pregnant. Go be unpregnant. That's fine. Like I'm yeah. here for you. And so I think when it comes to that, the only thing that I can ever say is because um, I'm not here to change anybody's mind. I'm here to support and give resources and invite people to come, you know, be a part of of not giving up. Um, the only thing that I can say to antis is that I really, really, really hope that you put some thought into um, whether you believe in the separation of church and state. And then if you do believe in a theocracy, if you want like a white Christian nationalism to thrive here, then um, then that's a really that's a really dangerous position to take. And it's not my it's it's not my place to try and change your mind um, or antagonize you. My job becomes protecting other people from that. And that's where I'm going to focus my energy. So I can just walk away from that feeling sad about the situation. Yeah. But I'm not getting in an argument with anybody. I'm not trading negativity back and forth because it doesn't do anything but, you know, but entrench. There are people who are, who are really great at asking those open questions and drawing out people's beliefs and helping to de-radicalize. I don't think I have the personality for it. I get too intense. Yeah. But yeah. if you're one of those people, like we need you and yeah. like, I'm so glad you exist. I wish I was like that, but I'm not, I just get too intense. So I got to take myself out Yeah. and yeah. like invite myself to the, 
to the table of planning action and making a tangible impact. That's that's great. That's great. And I'm glad you're doing that, sir. That's so important for the culture. Thank you. Yeah, and it feels good. The the other option is despair. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. want that. 100%. Um, so tomorrow then is the day of action. I'm in Toronto. What do we do? Here? Is there, it'll happen here too. Um, I don't know if people are talking about striking in Canada, right. but, oh, I, okay. but I bet if you looked up local, like just local abortion protest, wherever you are, if you see something, um, yeah. like absolutely go to it if you can. I remember when things were happening, like in when we were doing, um, I was at a March for Palestine, I don't know, last summer, maybe it was. And uh, while we were there, people were showing on their cell phones, like, here are all the countries in the world that are showing solidarity today. So you get like Calgary and Barcelona and Lima and like it's so inspiring so absolutely if you're outside of the United States and you have the opportunity to show solidarity like we'll see it it'll it'll like it'll put wind in our sails That's um, and then also like whether you can go to a protest or not if you're a guy you have such a huge opportunity to talk about this kind of thing with your guy friends when there are no femme people in the room. And like that goes farther than anything that I can ever say. Yeah. So um, I'm not pushing anybody to do it by any means, but like, I want you to know that it means a lot when it happens because unfortunately um, my words just don't carry as much weight with right, the right. I'm trying to reach. And so, so it's a okay. good strategic move. That would, that's great. And, and I think, I mean, I, I don't know how you feel, but like, I, I feel like it would be good to do that even. Like, I know some guys who are, because in real life, I don't know a single guy. And I know conservative asshole guys. But this anti-abortion thing, they're like, it's so stupid. Like, they're just yeah. too, pra they're just so practical yeah. on that one. And like I said, Dave Portnoy and like a lot of, of smart conservatives, I think men have come out and saying like, this is such a dumb waste of time. Why are we doing this? Um, where... Okay, so if, if I'm going to do, if, if I do that, which I do, I, which I would probably do on the internet. I mean, there's just the people on YouTube that are just, they're, they can't stop. They can't hold yeah. it in. They got to, yeah. it's bursting out. Like I got to, oh, so then, so then you just kill the baby or whatever it is. Like mm -hmm. they just can't help themselves. So, and it seems like the best thing they react to is like just facts, facts, facts. Like, you know, they want that. So then what's the best, I guess, research to, yeah. to do for that? Like what's the best thing to go to the ACLU, the American Civil Liberties Union has great stuff. They have good researchers. They turned me down as a researcher. It wasn't on this initiative, but that was the hardest interview process I've ever been through in my life. Second hardest, most rigorous interview process I've ever done in my life. They know their stuff. I, I went to the Columbia University Institute for the Study of Human Rights. I took human rights courses at Columbia Law School. I went to the School of International and Political Affairs for Diplomacy. I lived in nine different countries in three years studying comparative religion and had like a like top of the class billing in research. And I still wasn't good enough for these superstars. That's wow. how good, that's how good these researchers are. Like, I cannot speak highly enough. Uh, so anything the ACLU does and also HRW, Human Rights Watch in general, is a great resource. But ACLU, when it comes to abortion rights, that's where I've been getting my information that I trust because I know the people that they have working yeah. for them at every single level are the best in the world. Okay. You're going to hate this maybe, possibly, potentially. What do you think of the Amber Heard case where they do you think that was a fumble on their part or was that or are you familiar with it at all or So that one I I chalked up to performative media circus and yeah. decided to not subject my heart to that but right. if anyone is interested in learning about coercive control in relationships do some googling because it's fascinating uh Look up a woman named Laura Richards, who is doing advocacy around coercive control and legislation in the United Kingdom 
and maybe Ireland, maybe Laura Ireland Richards. Control? You said Laura Richards. Coercive control. Coercive control. Learn about coercive control and legislation around coercive control. Because if you care, whichever side, or if you're not on a side with that case, if you care and you're interested in that case at all, this right. is where you can learn about what's going on and about what people are trying to do to protect folks from being subjected to coercive control, having their freedom taken away and having their lives taken from them. It's really good stuff. Yeah, so I mean, more coercive control if you're into that stuff. Yeah, it sounds like um, it sounds like brainwash. Sounds like cult brainwashy kind of stuff. That's what I'm saying, man. A cult is just another version of an abusive relationship. Yeah. Totally. So, so you so do you feel like um, in that relationship? Are we, are, so this is in reference to the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case? You're no, like, coercive. This predates the Johnny Depp and Amber, Amber Heard case. Laura right, Richards right, right. has been um, trying to put together data and arguments and legislation um, around coercive control for a very, very long time. I've been following her for a long time. I don't even know, maybe, maybe even 10 years by this point. Um, like I wanted to work for her ages ago. I'm really passionate about um, making laws that protect people from coercive control so that the justice system can help protect people instead of making them more vulnerable and more likely yeah. to be C Coming out of cults, coming out of cults, it's like a good, it's like a good thing to educate people on. Mm -hmm. uh, are you familiar with Steve Hassan at all? I feel like he's doing incredible work right now. I've I seen him and he pops up and I watch a lot of documentaries and he pops up in those um, or like Rick Allen Ross will pop up in similar things. I haven't learned that much um, about him. I've gotten into Yanya Lalich. Are you familiar Yanya with Yanya Lalich? That? Let's see Yanya Lalich. He's dope. He, so, he, he has YouTube videos? Yanya is a woman, I believe she's a psychologist, but she could be a psychiatrist. Let me pull this up. It's spelled J-N-J-A-L-A-L-I-C-H. Oh, she's a sociologist and writer. I love her stuff. When I need to feel like seen or when there's something about my own experience that doesn't make sense to me, Ooh. I go to Yanya. She's got a lot of cult stuff. This is like mm -hmm. another, there are no. so many people in the game. She's got books. Like I'm listening to one of her audio books right now. Yanya, we got to get Yanya on the show. This is great. Yeah. How online conspiracy groups compared to cults. Interesting. Oh, I just, I find her very measured and very authentic. She doesn't need to make things sensational, which I really like. Um, yeah. I just, Amazing. I think marvelous. Great. Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you for the tips. This is good stuff. Yeah, for sure. And then uh, tomorrow, yeah, I feel like maybe tomorrow I should do like some kind of a live stream where people can come on and debate because people are so mad. Even just like the one or two posts I've made, people are like DMing me and be like, oh yeah, well, bro, get on a debate. I'll debate you. Abortion makes sense. You don't know what you're talking about. You're brainwashed by the liberals. It's crazy. Yeah, I I would leave it up to you to what kind of vibe kind of research you oh, want. Yeah to create True. um but but like if you if you can create a vibe that is productive you yeah. know that has like loving kindness in it yeah then, we're always trying to raise the vibration here i mean it can't be yeah. like a, it's you know that that's why i i know it sounds so appeasing but that's why i just want to tell these guys that like it's not like everyone's out there killing babies they, they make it out like that like it's just like it's a life it's a good tool for recruiting. It's a good tool for getting people to the ballot box. It's a good tool for fundraising yeah, yeah. both sides. And unfortunately, you know, have you ever watched the documentary Jesus camp? Yeah. Great. Great one. A long so time ago. I watched about it. Those kids growing up and making it their life mission. And then yeah. somebody arguing with you about that is probably not going to help very much. Um, yeah. But also, you know, you have, that incredible woman who came out of the uh, the Phelps family, who somebody was just asking open-ended questions to her, and then 
like she was pulled out of that horrible cult um, and sees things totally differently than the way that she was raised, which was very hateful and angry. And like, so there is a way to do it. And I way. love that you're thinking of making like a community space tomorrow. I think that's awesome. Yeah, I will be absolutely great. stop by oh, because be great. Yeah. I'm in Texas and it's going to be really hot and I won't be outside all day tomorrow. <laughs> well, you're protest. You're, you're uh, no work. So maybe tomorrow is not the day to bring on the debate. Tomorrow's the day to just bring on the, uh, the, you know, the anti-abortion side. I think, I mean, there's room for everything. There's like, let's everything, just yeah. do it all. Yeah. Um, but probably for the hottest part of the day, I'll be home. So if you do it, I will be there. Amazing. Yeah, let's do it. Um, all right, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll text you if we're doing it. But uh, we should, I mean, it would be good to even just pull up more stuff because the propaganda is ridiculous. And I think yeah. it would be good for the culture to just review some of it. Just review yeah. how, like, and not, I don't want to say, even debunking is maybe too harsh of a word for some of these guys, but like, just looking at it, loving yeah. awareness, as they say, just giving it, just watching it and saying, is this, does this make sense? Really? Like, do we need to be worried about this? It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Cool. Well, before we coming. wrap up, I yeah. have a request to make. Yes. Tell me. It must be done. So, as I have... I, my dog just came in so excited. Hello. Oh, no, request. Hi, I'm here. Me, baby. Hi. <laughs> so, um, Hera, do you want to come here and show your pretty the face? Dog, the dog is great production value. They're so cute. Come here. Just oh, no, she's like, I want to play keep away with my broccoli shaped toy. Okay. All right. Okay, I get that's that. Okay. That's fair. Wow. That's fair. <laughs> <Dog> okay. <has laughs> um, come here. He's like, come like here. you have a cat. It's like a, a very cat thing to do, you know, for a dog. Oh, come here. Come here. Here she comes. Here we have. Oh my come gosh, here, you got a big one, eh? Woo! Here's Hera. Hi, baby. Hi, Say hi, baby dog. Baby. She wants Please. attention. She wants me to stop. But, um, <laughs> hi, sweetie. Yes, I know. Okay. She's like, Mama. Now she wants to climb on top of the computer. You okay. got a huge one. Is that a Great Dane? She's a Doberman. Oh my God! She's big, She's huge, She's a big lady. Okay, all right, you can the lie down. Talking about dogs, the big ones are quiet, but then the small ones are loud. The small ones can. Yeah, I have a small one too, and she's the one that's that's barking. Thank you, you are just a conservative nightmare. You know, my uncle, he would always say, like, <laughs> "You guys all have, you guys all have dogs, and these Muslims are having kids, and you got a little Chihuahua." <laughs> well, because I can afford a dog, but I cannot afford a child yeah, or yeah. a home. Yeah. But um, so, OK, so here's what I'm working on. I because there's just kind of that one article and almost nothing else about life spring on the Internet. Yeah, I decided little. with a friend of mine to make a documentary about it. But Amazing. we haven't been able to find hardly anyone who was exposed to life spring, either by participating in the seminars or having like a parent or a close friend or relative do life spring. Yeah. So I wanted to give out an email address. If anybody has a story to share, I want to hear it. And if you are willing to share that story publicly, that's amazing. That would give a perspective to our film that we really need. Um, but also if you just want to talk about it and you don't want to talk about it publicly, I've never spoken publicly about it until today. Wow. Um, like, I get it. And we can just chat. So if anybody has experience with life spring, mind dynamics, life dynamics, leadership, dy and, you know, any arc international, any of the Asia, any works. Of the Asia works is the Asian one, I think. Um, and ARC, ARC was one of those for a while. So ARC. just reach out. Um, the So the email address that I have for us is the interruption film at Gmail. And Again, no pressure to speak publicly, but I really want to hear about people's experiences because what I have so far is mostly just me and my family. Yeah, I mean, look, look, you got you got eight, you got seven kids of the guy, mm -hmm. you know, so that's a lot. But uh, but yeah, there's got to be more stuff. There's got to be more stuff out there. Yeah. I was looking too. I was looking for more stuff on it, and that's why I ended up at more Elgat because Elgat seems like the side that really won out, or like that yeah. that that because well, that's the larger umbrella. Over yeah. all of it. Yeah. But uh, what's it called? It's doing really well. Those guys are killing it. Those uh, landmark forums. Landmark Those guys forum. Are... Yeah. That's like, that's the golden child of the Elgats. And yeah. Life Spring is like the little brother that went to jail. Didn't quite make it, did he? Oh, <laughs> poor guy. I can't believe Nexium, that guy was in it too. 
I think mm-hmm. he was he was in uh, he was in he was in MLM, but MLM I think they took the same program too, same curriculum. And right, yeah. Like so their multi-level marketing um, scheme, which was a pyramid scheme, um, and was shut down for that, was called Holiday Magic, and that's where leadership dynamics began, where they all did that together. Nice. So it's all tied Thick together. Thick as thieves. Thick as thieves. These sinners. And yeah. If, if you know somebody that was impacted or you were impacted by Holiday Magic, definitely re- reach out to me. I would be amazed to hear those stories. Holiday um, Magic, Life Spring. Yeah, if anyone's been in, let us know. And um, I have like a sign-up sheet too, but also I'll include your... You want me to just include your email address in this in this description? Yeah, it's the, the interruption. Wait, let me make sure I get it right. Because I'm still keeping my... Like, I know that I'm probably going to get stalked again now that I'm releasing oh. my last name. Yeah. But my email address has my middle name in it. So I'm trying to keep that under wraps. But okay, the, I I'm going to put it up the right here. Com, I think is what I had texted. You shared with. this with me yesterday. The interruption film at gmail.com. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. The interruption film at gmail.com. Yeah. So if anyone here is like, oh my God, I was in live spring. And I totally, yeah, it's so interesting that your brother had to tell you, had to send you like the Wikipedia and be like, I think we were in a call. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, if anyone else, uh, yeah, make sure you sign up. Make sure you send an email. M- Holiday magic too. I, you know what? Tomorrow. So if mm-hmm. you want to come back tomorrow, I'm down to just review like abor- like just cringy abortion stuff. But uh, mm-hmm. what's Holiday Matt? Like, I don't know. If I find something about Holiday magic, maybe we could even look at that. Yeah, it was the pyramid so scheme that started it all. Um, yeah, Robert Holiday White, magic. my dad. Yeah, he didn't start out being, you know, founding what would become a cult. He started out in predatory multi-level marketing. Holiday magic. So they're doing like some kind of a gift giving Christmas time. No, it's huh. think holiday like vacation. So like, oh, you have that holiday magic tan. It's like your vacation magic is showing. And they sold oh. makeup just like Avon. Oh, okay. So holiday magic is a tan. Okay. So they're a makeup company. All right. We yeah. had, we did a, we did a, um, something a couple of days ago about uh, timeshares and va- now they call them vacation clubs, but very similar thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Scammy. So that's where, that's where my dad got his start was in a multi-level marketing makeup company. That was yeah. a pyramid scheme. That is wild. And in order to get a promotion at holiday magic, you had to pay your own money to take a course through leadership dynamics. Oh, so he was doing the, he did the, this is, of course, it's yep. like you add a product to the brainwashing system. That's yep. Classic. Yep. classic. I like this footage. It's great. Isn't it amazing? Um, if you freeze those women with the red background, all of them look like they're begging for help silently with their eyes. Yes, they like, are. They are. Like they're... Somebody please get my children. I haven't eaten in days. They're going to p- put me back in the pit. Like those yeah. are the expressions on their faces. Like, please, oh Deborah, get somebody to help me. This, these two are like just lost. They're like, what am I doing? This one's like, why did I sign up for this? Ha, <laughs> smile. <laughs> yeah, just. Oh, like, yeah. I love the outfits. Very oh. JW. <laughs> I mean, Jeho- they do look chic. They're very chic. The Jehovah's Witnesses too. They dress up like stewardesses, and they that's when they when they go out for their sales mm-hmm. calls. Very. Uh, well, classy. that's how you show that you're a professional, but you're not threatening because you're women's professional. Oh, I'm a stewardess. The mm-hmm. <laughs> Classic. Um, yo, thanks for coming. And come back tomorrow. Yeah, if you're down. I mean, I think I'll be so. around. I, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah. I mean, you have to. You're on strike. So done. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me see. Let me see what I can find. I have been going down rabbit holes of like anti abort abor- anti abortion propaganda, and there's yeah. some cringy stuff out there. So that'll be that'll be fun. Well, thank you so much. This has thank been a joy. Yeah, what a fun you. day. Thank you. Wow. Three hours. That's great. I appreciate yeah, it. It didn't feel like it. I know, right? It's, it's podcasting. We're live on YouTube. Um, <laughs> so many people here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, yeah, thank you all. I forgot at times that anybody was watching, but thanks. Yeah. Empress Lane is here. Uh, we got a lot. We do have two like anti-abortion people just arguing in the audience, too. But uh, Nat- Nat- Natalie's been here the whole time. I hope maybe we got some Hello. points in with them. I don't know. Uh, Bolt is here, Digital Solutions Media, Yahoovi, Demandork, uh, Empress Lane, thank you for coming, Black Smurf, thank you for coming, Don Ice. Of course, uh, there is a 
David Barron, a.k.a. Dentalian Jones, who sent me this book, Building Your Cult. Thanks for sending the book. Dude, I appreciate it. Um, Ayush Sharma is here. David Barron, like I said. George Ina, Bolt. Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. And remember, you are loved. And, uh, you know, don't join a cult, okay? It's uh, it's not worth it. It'll ruin everything. And, um, and of course, if anyone has been in uh, Holiday Magic or Lifespring, make sure you send an email to theinterruptionfilm at gmail.com. Thank Thanks you. Thanks everyone for coming. Thanks, Alicia. Thank Bye. you so much. It's been a pleasure.